Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Fire Dev, a fireside chat with people in the industry. Today my guest is Graham McAllister. Graham, how are you doing? Abraham, I am very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm, you know, it's you know, end of the week. Exactly. Uh, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, because I'm doing a lot of DIY in the house, I know the weekend is going to be more tiring than the week. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I need the work week to recover Relax. from the weekend, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, these days. But, you know, it's good. Life's good. And, you know, I can't really you know, complain too much. I, so, I'm, not a, I'm not a DIY person, so um, I'm not envious of your weekend ahead. But, hey, if you enjoy it, that, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends on what type of DIY. If it's something where I'm assembling stuff, creating stuff, and I think that kind of lends into, you know, my background as a programmer, I really do, mm. you know, I enjoy that. But if it's decorating, like painting, for example, I, I've done it. I don't find it difficult, per se, but I just, uh, that's something I would rather hire someone else to do versus yeah. if I had to spend two days you know, assembling wardrobes and cabinets, like, uh, you know, I've been putting cabinets up, you know, assembling wardrobes, like that's the stuff that I've literally been doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort yeah. to do, you know, right. But I enjoyed it and it's stuff that I don't mind doing. But like I said, stuff like decorating, I've never tried tiling, but, and I, I've heard how difficult that is. I definitely wouldn't attempt that, uh, you know, because I've seen some <laughs> jobs where you just think you should have hired a professional. Whereas with painting, not too difficult, but again, it's just no, not something I enjoy. So knowing your strengths is very wise. Yes. Like, and what, you know, what you're willing to do, because like my dad, he loves painting out, you know, out of the DIY part of it. He finds it very, therapeutic he usually just ends up listening to a like a, a star wars podcast you know whilst he you know does it like he he does the ironing at home as well he's all ever since i've you know ever since i can remember he's always done the ironing and he ends up listening to like a star wars podcast yeah, <laughs> you know whilst exactly. yeah you know, and you know he was listening to i remember old star wars like, i mean they were current then but they were like old star wars podcasts like 10 15 almost 20 years ago when i don't think podcasting was even a term Mm. Uh, I think it's more like a radio show almost, but not live. <laughs> wow, I don't think I remember that. I would yeah. be old enough, but I, I don't remember it. Yeah, yeah they, it's one of those, where, like, it was just the odd, you know, people that were doing it, and they just had, like, a little bit of a fan base. And but obviously now, you know, we're on a podcast, you know, now, uh, you know, you got Joe Rogan's podcast, you know, and you got all these other ones out there. It is its own thing now. It is its own create own industry i i see people online that are you know celebrities but then when i see what they're doing now it feels like they're just doing mm. podcasting and social mm-hmm. media and not much more in terms of their celebrity side of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah but you know talking about you know obviously you know what you've you know been up to on your linkedin page he yeah. says you're a founder of team sync limited and he says you, it's an organizational psychologist in video games. You know, you I know. Am. so what is Team Sync and what is an organizational <laughs> psychologist? So I wouldn't worry too much about the Team Sync. It's really, as you know, in the UK, you just need a company to, um, you know, to, to, to invoice through and, yes. you know, that sort of thing. So that's the, that's the name of the company. I did try and make it reasonable, though. Um, so Team Sync, I guess it gives away my my main focus uh, is to keep teams aligned. So I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, and we'll get we'll, maybe, we'll delve into that delve into that I guess. But what that means is organizational psychology is really about um, the science of how teams perform. So the question that I'm really obsessed with, you might say, is what makes um, a highly effective team uh, or a high performing team or a high performing studio. And if you're interested in those sorts of questions, which I think many people in the games industry are, not everyone, again, maybe we'll get to these questions, but but most people are. Um, so how can you stack the odds in your favor so that the behaviors and things that your team does is more likely to lead to your success than not? So that is organizational psychology. Okay. And, you know, is this a role that you would say is common? in you know companies right now because it's not a role like you know computer programmer you know environment artist for example that you know a lot of companies will you know at a decent size have them 
Um, like, is this organizational psychologist in like the tech industry a thing right now? It it is in the tech industry. You wouldn't probably see that name though. Um, there's no set name for it. So the reason I chose organizational psychologist is that's the kind of generic catch-all name. But as people tend to specialize, for example, uh, at some point I could imagine I might replace that with, I don't know, team alignment specialist. You're know, just telling people exactly what you do. Um, so this role does exist. It is not in the games industry um, very much, I would say. I have seen people with organizational psychology degrees in the game industry, but they may not do that role. Um, the other name for this is industrial organizational psychology or IO psychology. It also has links with HR. Um, so the foundations of the fields is kind of similar, and then they split. The broad difference, more or less, being the HR would focus on the individual, like the the well-being and growth uh, of the individual in the workplace. But organizational psychology is more at the group or team level. So questions I might answer, like culture, that can only exist at the team level. It doesn't exist at the, the individual level. Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting one where... You know, if you've got a startup and there's two, three, four, five of you, hmm. it's, it's, you know, definitely the last type of role you're going to be <laughs> hiring for. Even like a project manager role, you're not really hiring for that when there's only two or three of you and you might be getting a contractor, for example, you know, so, temporarily. You know, you know, obviously there's, there's two or three roles and that's really it. So, yeah, it is one of those things where I guess the, the bigger the organization gets, the other side aspects that can, you know, it's almost like, you know, the low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. you know, gets picked and then it's like, okay, how can we make our, you know, team more efficient, better uh, and company overall, you know, get to the next stage. All the easy stuff has been effectively done. How can we figure it out? And I feel like this is one of those areas where it's the one where you probably need a bit more knowledge and resource and money to, to leverage it properly or you know I, would that be correct yeah. assumption so let me try and persuade you otherwise <laughs> and, and maybe maybe i'm trying to persuade myself here so <laughs> let's admit let's get the biases out of the way i'm an organizational psychologist so that's my view on the world at the moment and in my previous careers you know when i, I had a different job i saw the world that way um so this, that again just putting the biases on the table um, you know, this is how I see the world, but I will try and persuade you otherwise. So you were saying, hey, look, if you're a small studio, obviously or an organizational psychologist may not be among the first four or five people you hire because you need people who actually, let's say, do the work. And I'm doing inverted commas with my fingers here, if that helps the audience. <laughs> uh, you know, people see doing the work as the actual, you know, hands-on producing things. But here's the reframe. Um, I would say that at the minute, one of the biggest mistakes in companies is that obviously they don't have these roles. And I think we're going to get to these stories tonight is that the reason I'm doing this job, this is not my, um, my first career, let's say. I chose to retrain into this career because what I saw was this is the biggest problem in the games industry. In other words, if you want that small team of four to five people, yes, you could hire the programmer, the artist, you know, and, and just, you know, get a game done, let's say. Um, I think if you see success and your team grows, then you will feel the pains really quickly. And the problem of not setting off in good stead, in other words, having good culture to begin with, is that the people who set the studio and start the studio, that becomes the norm. The norm this is normal to do that. And if you try and change that later on, that can be incredibly difficult. So my framing today is, um, like I would say, Okay, let's be a bit crazy here. I would imagine a job that I would like to do in the future, and I will maybe rethink this after six months, but let's say it now. I could imagine a job I would like to do is to be a studio head. So why am I saying that an organizational psychologist would make a good studio head? It's because the role of that job is to set the conditions for success. Not the people, we'll get to that later. So starting with people first, my argument is, well, the science's argument is, that is the wrong way around. What you want, to, what I want you to think, the reframing I'm we're, we're discussing here is, let's get the conditions for success correct first, and then what we will do is bring the people into those conditions, and that is the recipe for a successful team over a long period of time. And there's two main conditions I will say in my theoretical head of studio that I'm trying to paint here. 
One is um, I want a clear vision for the studio. Where are we going? And the second one is clear a clear culture. I know vision is part of culture, but I'm going to separate them out. And the culture, I'm, what I mean here is how we work. How will we get there? What decisions will we make as a team to deliver that vision? Now, once we get down to the operational level, we need to bring people in who would want to stick by that set of values to achieve that vision. That is how we're going to go about hiring the right people. Uh, again, I think we'll get into hiring, you know, and why some companies are doing it wrong uh, and the evolution of hiring. But I'm going to say this clearly that the main conditions I would set a studio head, if you want success, is set a clear vision, a clear shared vision, and understand your values that will help you achieve that vision. Everything else is after that. How do you feel about that? I mean, I... For me personally, I still feel like when you're three, four people and I say it's a startup, I agree that these sort of areas that aren't immediately thought of and discussed, are, you know, it probably is something that, you know, you should have, you know, a discussion around. Obviously, you know, if there, let's say, 100 hours of work going into the, you know, startup, you know, 80 hours of it shouldn't be around probably culture and organizational psychology or anything you know in that realm but definitely having one or two hours of the 100 hours a week let's say you know it's definitely something you know worth while well, having a clear vision having a clear you know direction and you know uh, that's definitely something i've come across a lot from myself you know experience and but also from other founders as well is making sure that everyone does have a clear direction because that is definitely one of the you know problems with startups and one of the reasons they fail is the you know the co-founders don't have a clear vision of what they want or their visions not aligned like one person or you know you know think we want to do this the other person want to do this or you know they want to do the same thing but they all have like a different path that they are taking and i think it, the lack of communication so i think the role or the you know, you know, organizational psychology can definitely be beneficial to a very small organization where they just three or four of you that can fit in just like a small, you know, room or like, let's say, you know, garage, if you want to talk about it in, you know, the Silicon Valley, you know, I, uh, <laughs> idealistic sense. But yeah, I, I don't think it's someone that you would necessarily hire at that point, unless somehow, you know, let's say you got $10 million of funding, but for some reason you're still only four or five people, then obviously that might be a different matter. But then at that point, you probably would hire a wide variety of different people anyway. And organizational psychologists might be one of them. For you, so, like, what's, uh, what was you going to say, Graham? You I was going to say, so let's, maybe we can separate this out because there are lots of caveats in the conversation, obviously. Um, let's not focus on the role. So you, we were talking about, you know, um, should, should an organizational psychologist be one of the first hires? And again, this is just a thought exercise. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. This is just us brainstorming, right? But let's ask the question, uh, well, let's, let's not talk about should you hire one or not. Let's look about the layer deeper, which is why would you want to hire one from the beginning of your studio? And my argument was, well, from the evidence that I'm seeing about the success or failure of game studios, the number one predictor is having a clear vision. That is, there's nothing that beats it so far. And I take that from the Game Outcomes Project, which is still the biggest study the game industry has done, even though it was done in 2014. Um, and that study, it's on gamedeveloper.com. You can, you can search for it. But they asked the question, how does your team work and what was the outcome? And they sent that survey to big studios and small studios. And then when they you know, analyzed the results, they presented them in um, descending order. So there was a list of 40 issues that will contribute to your team's success or failure. And number one on the list was having a clear shared vision, number one. So that was the statistically the most important quality your team can have um, to deliver the, the, the game success. So again, we're, so we're separating out here the person, like an organizational psychologist, from the reason you would have that person, which is, well, um, like the work I do is mainly around team alignment. Do you know where you're going? And the Game Outcomes Project was saying, that is the thing you would do. When I heard you talk, you were kind of saying, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Again, this is 
the discussion we'll have, you were saying, well, it was more about making the game. Can they do the thing? Can they program? Can they do the art? Mm-hmm. That ability, in other words, experience, did appear on that list of the top 40 factors, but it was roughly equivalent to number 36, like your experience. So what they were saying is, okay, if you're going to compile a team to be successful, um, the, their experience of doing the thing they can do is roughly equivalent to number 36 on the list. So there are 35 things more important, statistically more significant, to contribute to your team's success than that. So that's why I'm saying, look, all you know, these teams who have got the gurus and the ninjas, and oof, I'm not obviously keen on terms like that, but you can find people who are very, very experienced as individuals. But that says nothing about their ability to work as a team. You know, it's just the individual quality. So again, this is me trying to um, present the evidence and saying, okay, um, what? let's ask a different question instead of who should be in the team. What needs to be in place for your studio if you want success to be on your side or to increase your chances? And the top factor is team alignment. What that study did not say, or in fact that I can find any real evidence for, was a solution. So they said, yes, 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 this is the thing you, you want to do um, to have the most impact on your team achieving success, good luck. You know, it wasn't like, oh, and here's how you do it. And I spent years looking at different solutions for, well, if it keeps coming up as a, a problem, um, for example, NASA had the same finding. NASA investigated their teams. Google investigated their teams. And these findings keep coming up at the top or near the top. But none of these teams really said how to go about solving the team alignment issue. Um, but again, that's why, that's the main work that I do today. I know we're going, we're going to tie this up, I guess. But So that's me saying, you were saying, well, it's about experience and getting people to do the thing. And I'm saying, well, I can't really find the evidence for that. I know you need to make a thing, but I really would prefer to know what you're doing first and then we'll put the people in. Um, but I'm not saying you need a person to do that. You just need a way of doing it. That needs to be ticked off the list. How do you know that this collection of people, whether it's four people or 400, how do you actually know that they're all working towards the same target? Yeah, I mean, I after you put it that way, I do 100%, you know, agree with you there that, you know, having, you know, like the core skills of, let's say, being able to, let's say, if you're programming, being able to program and being good at, you know, a certain language, for example, you know, though important, uh, you know, isn't as important as some other factors like alignment. And it's something that I've seen in my own journey as, you know, being a startup founder, uh, you know, over the years and speaking to a lot of other people, you know, on the podcast over the last year, but also just prior to the podcast, because this sort of realm of startups and entrepreneurship has always been something that I've been interested to interested in and you know being involved in and as a result i've been in touch with a lot of people over the years you know co-founders that raised money that haven't raised money that have done well that haven't done well you know young old all that sort of stuff and definitely one of the things i commonly see you know especially in terms of failure is misalignment in you know values Mm -hmm. in dynamics of the team in you know direction because i remember a friend of mine he had a a startup funded a few years ago he they raised half a million dollars he's in the uk but they raised half million you know dollars so probably at the time must have been 350 370 thousand pounds and within it was the him and a another guy it was the other guy was uh older than you know, us, because my friend was, you know, my age, I'm 31 now at the time, my friend was probably about 29, you know, late 20s, and, but the other guy was in his, you know, 50s, and he, he was an ex-relatively early Facebook employee, so he did pretty well off, like, stock options, so initially he bootstrapped, you know, the startup, and then, you know, they did raise money through, you know, his contacts, but, you know, they blew through that money real quickly. It's one of those things that you think a oh, half million, you know, they're never going to blow through it. And they wasn't doing stuff like, you know, buying cars or going on holiday. It wasn't crazy stuff like that. It was one, just, you know, hiring people and just hiring them at probably an above rate that they should have been. And then not keeping an eye on what they were doing. And then 
you know, like I remember the story of he hired, you know, the older guy, he hired a lawyer that he knew and he just trusted him. And he was, you know, higher in you know, a charging him like hundreds or like thousands, of, thousands of pounds just to prepare really basic documents that just, I remember he, my friend showed me what they were. He just seemed like he was like a template of the internet that you could grab. Obviously mm-hmm. now with chat GPT, you could just generate it, you know, you, you know, yourself and, you know, a better version or it'd be stuff like if he wanted a photocopy or something, he would charge like several pounds for like per sheet. Like it was stuff that on the surface of it, it doesn't seem super crazy but it, it you know it added up and then on top of that i remember you know saying to you know asking my friend you know like you know what do you and your you know your startup co-founder you know like to do what do you do outside of work and because i think you know that's a very important thing you know having that sort of connection with your startup founders that you want to hang out with them that you do do something whether that it might be playing game watching movies you know, discuss, maybe it's discussing business, playing some sports, going to the gym, you know, having something for bonding. And I remember him saying, oh, we never had, we've never once hung out after work. We, we've got like nothing in common. And I, was, I remember just thinking, that's that's not good. Like, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then there were several other things, you know, essentially as an extension of that, branching off that it was just misalignment in terms of what you know their goals were what they wanted to do and partly was age you know the older guy he was married had for like two or three kids in school and as a result he wouldn't come into work till like nine ten. he would wrap up by like four five uh like this is mm-hmm. so he was at home to you know have you know food with his kids at like six o'clock which is fine mm-hmm. fair enough i've got kids now i understand that but where my friend because he was younger didn't have any family, you know, obviously, you know, like married or anything at the time. He had a relationship, but that ended up, you know, collapsing effectively. And it's partly because of the hours he was putting into start, but startups. So I think that there as well. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if they had been honest, both of them with each other and themselves, they probably would have been more aligned with a clearer vision and maybe even said, it's not going to work out, you know, us two, yeah. uh, you know, that combination. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I do agree, you know, obviously going back to your original point of, you know, organizational psychology and figuring out, you know, what, how a team can be successful, that there's definitely a lot more to it than just the core skill yeah. of making the product. And I've seen it several times before. You do need team alignment. You do need, you know, the values, you know, what you want to do, how you want to achieve it, uh, you know, the, you know like how far you want to go with it. some people you know let's say if you just talk about it monetarily speaking some people might just want to take it to the point where they're earning fifty thousand pound a year and they're happy with that and they're not willing to put any significant you know more hours into the endeavor to get more money because that's fine mm-hmm. for them whatever their situation prior to that is then you might get someone that is like fifty thousand uh, i'm happy to work extra hours to get to 100 to get to 500,000 to get to a mid, like yeah. th- there might not be a limit that's also misalignment some people let's say in the 50,000 you know mindset might think oh that's great on with someone that has this vision and this goal but the problem is you're gonna because you're misaligned in terms of again this is just monetarily speaking you can easily put you know fit numbers on it because you're misaligned that person will want to do certain things uh, it may be take certain risks that you're not willing to put certain hours in and if you don't align with that and essentially go along with it then they're gonna get upset with you and then obviously mm-hmm. vice versa but i think that's obviously you know a huge you know problem so yeah i agree you know startups people and teams do need to figure these things out and i think it was an interesting thing that you mentioned that it can be from outside sources gurus ninjas obviously i know those sort of terms on Mm -hmm. you know social media influencers have become tainted but you know some sort of advisor you may or may not pay them and you know having someone that's gone through it and I think that's one of the great things about something like, you know, Y Combinator, you know, some sort of startup incubator. You have past, you know, startup founders, some of them successful, some of them not successful, part of the network, part of them are on, on the panels, on the, you know, part of the investors. Some of them are just there giving advice. And that, I think, even though 
the notion of organizational psychology and you know those sort of areas probably would never get mentioned the the discussions that will occur in terms of how to structure your team and in terms of a clear vision will probably mm. heavily touch on the sort of work that you do so some yeah i've seen some of the questions um that why combinator use or their approach or other vcs and you're right that some of the questions asked would touch on the principles. For example, they might ask, how long have you known each other? Mm. Um, and what they're trying to get at is the example you gave about the monetary value where some people, you know, they're comfortable hitting and earning a certain amount. But if we can generalize that problem and not talk about money, but rather say your values, what's important to you. The reason what, when you form a new team, for example, you're meant to spend time with that team to bond. And people think, you know, well, some people think at least, Oh, that's soft stuff. We don't need to do that, you know. And I'm assuming, by the way, you don't know people to begin with. So, so this is not a group of friends who have been through university and have known each other. This is a new team coming together. And you're meant to spend time at the beginning to get to know each other. And the reason is that you're through this these exercises that you do with each other, even if it's just hanging out or, you know, some sort of team building exercises, what you're doing there is understanding how each other works. And the longer you do that, the better you get at predicting how the other teammates are going to react when things go wrong. If you skip that step, what tends to happen is when things will, when things go wrong in a startup, and they might go wrong, there's a high chance, that you've no idea how people will react. And so you get surprised and friction happens and arguments happen because you, you don't know each other. So you just react how you always react and you think, oh, they'll deal with it, but they don't. So imagine <laughs> the alternative solution is hey, let's spend time at the beginning of our project so that we know each other. And by knowing each other, what that actually means is I know how you work. I know your values. I know that money is not important to you. I know spending time with your kids is important. Or I know being seen as being good at your job is important to you. If I understand that, when things go south, I can understand how you will react based on the circumstances. If I don't understand any of those things, then we're in trouble as a team. You know, now if everything was perfect, which it won't, you know, in that hypothetical situation, maybe you're lucky and get through it. But so this this is related to, you know, what you were saying about, you know, this, this vision is related to your values. You know, I want to bring together a group of people towards a common goal. That's the vision. They have to want to go on this journey. You know, if I say I'm a founder and I understand clearly where we're going, I'm going to build a company that does this thing. I'm going to tell people, you know, the vision of this company. This is why it exists. If you want to do that also, you should join my company. But that alone is not enough. I also need to understand how do you work? So the we're going to branch into hiring here, I think. So the bad way of doing it, let's call it the old way, would have been, okay, um, I can talk about the vision of my company. I'll just go and hire someone who's very skillful at the thing. And by, by the way, when I meant uh, ninjas and gurus, I didn't mean consultants or anything like that or experts. What I meant was whenever you see job ads, you hear people saying, we're after a, a ninja to join our lovely team. And, you know, that, that's the things I was getting against. That, that doesn't say anything about the person really. So, um, so, so again, back to this problem. I'm founding a company and I've articulated clearly the vision of the company. This is, what, this is why the company exists. Now my job is to go about building um, the right team. And I do that by understanding the values of my company. How am I going to achieve my vision? Well, let's say in my case that we're going to be ethical and innovative. There are two of the principles I will use to make decisions to achieve my company's vision. Whatever, you can, you can have your own. The old way of hiring would have been, forget about the values, we'll just hire people who are skillful. So I need a programmer, I will go and find the best programmer I have. And this is maybe, you know, the old way of hiring. And people found out the hard way that that's a really bad way to hire. Just going for skill does not work. So yes, you'll get the thing done, but those people have the potential to completely disrupt the company because they don't fit with the values. So the slightly better way after that, people said, hmm, hiring for talent is a very bad predictor of my company's success because the team is falling apart and they're arguing and there's friction. So there there was this idea of culture fit. And that said, well, if I know the values of my company, then I will hire people to fit in with my company. So if my values again are, we are ethical and we're innovative. That's what we, that's what we value on here. Those are the principles we use to make decisions, to solve problems. 
So I can hire people who also value that. And that sounds fine, right? The problem is that leads to group thing. So if I keep hiring people who are driven by being ethical and being innovative, yes, it may be good, but we may be lacking on innovation then because they're all valuing the same thing or they may be just like me. So we need to hire the current trend in thinking is culture add, which means, yes, yes, you need to be innovative or value innovation and ethics, but you probably want to go about it in a different way than me. So our approach is different. And there's basic ways of doing this, such as you know, where you were from, uh, maybe your age, maybe your educational background, um, but we can, it could be cognitive thinking as well. Just, you just approach it in a completely different way. So this is the most modern way of hiring that we have, this culture ad, you'll hear that term. Culture ad means I do not want people who are gonna fit in with me you, you will value what I value, but how you go about it, you are different than me. So there's lots of examples of this in the game industry. Um, both Netflix and Amazon have recently talked out about it uh, and said, we do not hire the old way anymore, the culture, the culture fit way. That has no place at Amazon or Netflix, for example. And individual game studios have also um, spoken up about that. I guess what we're getting at here is diversity. But again, diversity by itself does not solve the problem because without a clear vision, you have nothing to bind people together. So it's hard to talk about only half of the solution, which is if you're trying to build the best games company possible, and by best, I mean, people are happy at work and you know the games are good and you're achieving your vision, then yes, you do need to hire for diversity because that's going to give you the innovation part. But diversity by itself usually invites friction. So to try and reduce the friction, you need a common vision. And back to what I was saying earlier is, Although vision is also the top of every predict most predictors of a successful team, the bit that's missing is no one is really articulating a solution. Um, and that's the bit I've been working on for the last five years now. And that's what led me to the field of um, organizational psychology. Sorry for the long <laughs> description, because as you probably realize, a lot of these things are related. It's like, oh yeah, we'll just talk about, is your team aligned on a vision? It's like, okay, but what binds them together? Well, that's your values and okay, but value, you know, which value and how do you, how, how do you have both of these things in, in line at once, which is diversity, but what binds people together? Um, all these things are kind of interwoven really. Oh yeah, they are. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've got a question, you know, you know, around that, you know, obviously if you're a company, and you're hiring people and you are going down this approach of it's not just a matter of how good they are at doing the role. Obviously, it's about how they work in a team, the sort of team that you have, you know, the vision, you know, all that sort of stuff. When you and you mentioned that, you know, YC asks certain questions that are effectively, you know, touching on those topics in, you know, psychology. In your opinion, is it best to be open and upfront with the person you're potentially going to hire, you know, during the interview stage that I'm asking these questions for this purpose, for, you know, culture fit, for, you know, how you align with this vision, or is it better to ask those sort of questions, but get the information and not make it so obvious. That's what you're, you know, you know, you know, asking. Yeah, there, there are ways of doing it. There, there are even um, surveys, for example, one's called the workplace questionnaire. And it's basically trying to figure out, you know, what do you value? Um, and it is better for both sides. Like if you're going to join a company, if you're, let's say, lying to get in or, you know, um, just saying anything to get the job, you're probably not going to stick around because you'll realize how those people work. It's completely different. It's not it's not going to please you. Um, so yeah, I think it's okay to be to be clear. It's like, you know, either you give a survey which tries to make it as objective as possible. It's like, I don't have to ask you, hey, we're gonna have a chat and, and see how you feel here. Um, there's also situational tasks, you know, you can give people, which is you give a scenario and you just ask how they perform. And by analyzing how they perform, you, you would be able to prioritize, you know, their values essentially. Um, so I should say I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> A lot older than you. I'm also, we're meeting at an interesting time. So I'm retraining, as I mentioned. So I'm a student at London School of Economics in organizational psychology. And at LSE, for example, they say, well, once you graduate, you'll probably be looking for a job. 
And so they give us access to all the, the surveys and tools that um, a company will be giving you if you're applying for a job. And those surveys and tools that assess you come in different forms. So some is the workplace questionnaire, which is, you know, who are you essentially? Uh, some are how good are you, like raw mental processing, you know, logic and spatial awareness, all that kind of stuff. Um, and some are situational um, tasks, like how do you perform in this situation? So yes, the, these tools are ways for companies to ask these questions on scale because they don't have time to sit down and, you know, <laughs> like make what we're doing, interviewing individuals to figure out how you perform. Um, I even went through, for example, I'm going to say went through, I looked through the process of getting hired at Apple recently. And I don't know if anyone's looked at it, but it is fairly intensive, uh, very similar to Google's, by the way. So the first part of Apple's hiring process, um, yes, you obviously need the, the right degree for the job. So if you're a programmer, obviously you should, you should probably have some background in computer science. You don't necessarily need a degree, but you should be able to do the thing, right? Do the, do the programming. But on the first stage of the application process, they are already asking questions, prioritizing not what can you do, but who are you? You have to write, for example, in the, in the initial box about, you know, why Apple? And they even specifically tell you to link who you are to some social cause or some social cause that Apple has an interest in. So they're already trying to weed out people on stage one who just say, I'm brilliant at what I do. If you're brilliant at what you do, you'll knock it through phase one. It's like, thanks for letting us know, not interested. And a lot of companies are doing this. It wasn't just Apple. So this is interesting. The old way would have been, how good are you? What those companies are realizing is hiring people who are just looking at skill, they're a really expensive mistake. You're not welcome in these sorts of tech, even in the tech companies. And by the way, I know lots of people will say, what about all the tech issues in Silicon Valley, the toxic culture? Yes, but this is their attempt to try and solve that problem. They're trying to do something about it. They're aware of it. And that's why they're trying to say on the first page of the app application process, okay, who are you? Tell us something about you. That's what gets you through the door. It's what you prioritize and what you work. I'm going to skip a few stages, but the very last stage, for example, if you get through to that, that's where you go to the Apple campus and you are observed by... I think about eight to 10 people on the Apple team, they are watching you performing tasks. So again, they're not looking at what you do. They're also looking at how you do it. How do you interact as a team? They specifically say you will be, it will be uh, team oriented. They'll be looking at how you listen to others. Uh, are you forceful? Are you always looking to push through your suggestions through? Can you see that other people have maybe a better idea than you and you're willing to incorporate that into your thinking? Are you willing to reconsider based on what you've been told? Or are you just, no, I've shut down. It's my way or the highway. So they're at every stage of the Apple process, just as an example, they are always looking at how you work and your values. And, you know, the, the skill that you have, that is deprioritized. They assume either, you know, they'll figure out that you've been good enough or you can be trained for that. But retraining you for your values is very difficult indeed. Oh, yeah. And, you know, obviously with, you know, these big companies, because I've had people on the podcast, you know, like from Apple, for example, and one of the things that, you know, I've asked them, you know, what's, the, you know, what what is the recruiting process like? <laughs> Some of them have said it, it, it's from, you know, six months, 12 months, or a year plus from when they applied and to actually get in, you know, the yes and actually mm -hmm. starting. And then sometimes there's periods you know throughout that where they're not even getting any communication from them because it's not like a matter of you know every week or two they're getting you know updates so you know so they're saying that months sometimes months will go by and they'll think that okay i'm, I'm not getting the job at this company like google or apple and then they'll mm -hmm. start looking at other roles and then they'll come back and be like, yeah, congratulations, you've got through this stage, you're on to the next stage now, and they want to, you know, like observe you or, you know, f you know, figure things out. And yeah, it's like those sort of questions, you know, I, I, you know, it makes sense because obviously, you, you know, back in the day, not that many years ago, it would have been first, let's figure out, can you technically do what we're hiring you to do? And then afterwards, at the end, they might, you know, 
tack it on of, you know, what do you think about this? Or, you know, how would you approach, you know, this, for example? Or what do you think about Apple or, you know, the ethos of our company? Uh, but again, by that point, because you've already invested so much money and time and resources in, you know, going through with this person, if they've got past, you know, let's say the first two, three stages, and you know pass them with flying colors so they're technically capable and they're available you know for example then the other thing it kind of i think a lot of companies just overlooked it as long as it wasn't terrible the answers they was like eh, okay it's not 100 percent aligned with what we want but it'll be all right because they can do the job technically and we're just telling them what to do. Like I think there was definitely an element to that. And now it's like, okay, if they're not aligned with our vision as a company, we don't even want to know if they're technically capable because you know what's the point? Yeah, and this relates to like almost where we started the conversation and links to Y Combinator, not just Y Combinator, but any VC. So yes, they are touching on some of the things that lead to team success that I think an organizational psychologist would ask. But the, the main question I would ask is, is the team aligned? Because for me, that is, it is just, it's the leading predictor of success, you know? So the, just as one example, we'll maybe touch on a few. The story that really brought this to light, um, and it, it really brought to light the problem of working in the game industry today was, so Jason Screer, who was at uh, Kotaku at the time, he's not at Bloomberg. So he wrote the, the failure of Anthem and he asked the question, you know, how come this game was seven years in the making and it was a, let's say a flop, right? We, we can choose any word there, but it didn't perform the expectations. And in his long form investigation, this was 2019, in this long form investigation, he interviewed 19 members of staff who worked on the game uh, anonymously and they told their story. And the reason they got in touch with him is because they said, we don't want games to be made like this anymore. The way that we're going about making these triple a very expensive multi-year projects it's insane not only is it bad so although i've talked about vision alignment here it sounds like one thing oh yeah aligned on a vision let's move on we haven't really got to the main problem yet which is well what happens if you don't have that the, what happens if you don't have a team aligned on a shared vision is all the things that were mentioned in the kotaku article during the making of anthem and it's a really <laughs> it's a you know all the worst things you could imagine about working on a project you have people you know crying going to work you have people um, leaving the project you have massive amounts of friction you have delay you have people making features that never make it into the game you have a company exerting an influence even though they've no right to do that to do so so people who are far away from the actual project um, in this case it may be leaders at ea for example um exerting their influence on the project when they probably shouldn't be. So you know, this distortion of altering the vision because they have power. Like politics does come into it. I want this thing. We should do the thing. I'm in power. Go and do it. So why would you do that? That's not what we're making. You have lack of clear communication, a story being told that was weeks, you know, weeks old. What are we making? Is it this version or is it the version from months ago? You have, these are only some of the problems, you have people, there are multiple sites, because the game got so big, they recruited you know, other parts of Bioware um, to come in and help out. Um, but they couldn't agree either. So we had Bioware up in Edmonton and in different places. And they were even labeling each other, like you shouldn't be labeling anyway, but they were labeling each other as the A team and B team. And this is internally, this isn't even people outside, you know, giving the labels to those studios. This is the staff themselves saying, Oh yeah, that studio, they're, they're the B team. We, you know, we wouldn't expect them to do good work. So what was interesting about that article was that the, the staff said the root cause of all of these problems is lack of a clear vision. And that was the words that was used in the article. Normally when you're investigating a human error problem, which is, you know, something goes wrong in a company, what you're looking for always is not the effect like, oh, the staff are arguing or people are leaving or, you know, our game didn't do too well in the market. It's like, yeah, okay, that happened. Why? And what you're trying to figure out is how close can I get to the root cause of that? What is causing all those things to happen? And it was a very clear case in Bioware where they said, the root cause is we just didn't know what we were making. Now, I would add one further question, which is 
well, why don't you know what you're making? Uh, and that's probably more difficult in their case where you have this influence of EA, arguably, who recently bought them. Um, and you maybe had previous success, which is always a problem. People think previous success is a good thing because you know how to do it. But the research would kind of say the opposite, that actually if you have previous success, you're more likely to have failure next time because, well, maybe you've got some, uh, you, you, you're narrowing down um, your mindset possibly, which is, okay, I know how to do it now. So I just have to repeat that. Whereas if you really want the success the next time, what you should be saying is the circumstances are different. The market has moved, the team has moved. You meant to reevaluate. What's the situation like today? What you should be thinking is, okay, I have the potential to do it because I've done it before, but I don't want to lean on that. I want to use maybe the skills that I have, my power of you know, evaluating um, amongst others. So again, this, this vision problem that um, I mentioned that Kotaku article because it's not just one thing, we're not aligned on a vision. Most of the problems that we see in the game industry are caused by that. That's why it's number one. And that's why for me, going back to the Y Combinator or the, if I was a VC and I wanted my you know, $100 million back, yes, I would maybe get the questions about asking who the team is, but it wouldn't be top of the list. And it may not even be the top 10. Um, all the soft factors, do you know what you're making? What's the culture? You know, those are the things that I'd be really drilling down on. And then I might get to, okay, I feel pretty confident. Who are you going to get to do that? I mean, yeah, that is, that's definitely, you know, an interesting, you know, side of it. Because, you know, if you don't have that idea, you know, in mind, you, you'll fail real quickly. You'll, you know, you'll see the weaknesses in your approach real quickly. Actually, you know, some people don't even see the weaknesses and, you know, they hire mm -hmm. you know, for the wrong reasons. And like, you, you know, you see companies all the time, like they'll hire a lot of people yeah, and then they'll, you know, lay them off. I mean, partly mm -hmm. because, you know, they the, the might have been working on a project and that project didn't work out and they rapidly scaled or maybe there was something, econ you know, in the economy and as a result, they rapidly hired and now things have changed and they were having to let go. But the, I think there's also a huge part of it is when they do rapidly hire like that, and even these big companies like Facebook and Google and Apple, they do do this. Uh, when they do rapidly hire, they don't have as much time to do this vetting process and they might skip on the things that they may have done, you know, over the six to 12 months of hiring some of these people and then you know a lot of time it is like they'll hire contractors or consultants and then they just won't you know work out because they're not aligned with where they actually want to go and you know what they want to do as well and that's a great point actually because I was, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the role of leadership and for me like i think that a lot of leaders studio heads, any leaders. I know we could say that anyone's a leader, but let's say this senior leadership team at a company, founders, etc. I think most of them are not aware of how big a problem alignment is because it's just not, they may mention it or give it lip service, like, oh yeah, that sounds important, we should do that. But I think if I was to ask them to rank where, where it is in their list of importance, it'd be really far, really far down the list. And I think this is one of the problems with leadership that if your job as a leader, and I'm going to say the main thing you can do as a leader, your principal job is to set the is to set the conditions for success. Your job is to lay out how that studio works, how that team works, and then more or less, and I don't say step back, but focus on other things. But setting the conditions for success is what leadership is meant to do, and then put the right people in to implement that. So leadership versus, let's say, a manage you know management at the end operationalizing it if you're not aware that <laughs> that vision is so important you're not going to be setting that as part of your conditions so this is interesting that i think a lot of the reasons studios feel is because i don't think they're even aware of what actually is important for setting the right conditions i think there's still in, a lot of them are in the old mindset of hey we know technically how to make a game if we get these people in a room we can we can make a game right like, yeah, you, you could make a game maybe, but the people might be unhappy and you might burn through money and you may 
be remaking the game five times. And to bring that back to another example where, you know, we're talking about Bioware. There was a story in the press maybe three weeks ago, so it's really recent, where Bioware said they're laying off 20% of their studio. And the reason given was something like, I'm going to paraphrase, but it was something like, we need to get rid of some people to, to go lean again to find the vision of the game. So this keeps coming up. These, I collect these stories where people are saying, basically something bad happened in our studio. Either we're closing or we're pivoting or we're letting go of a bunch of people or we're having friction because of vision. It's, so it's, the, it's what this leads to that's a problem. And here you have Bioware who have made you know, some very well-known and successful games, but they still can't do this one thing. They still have massive struggles in, can we find the vision? Their history says, no, because that's what the staff are saying publicly. Um, just as an aside, I, I don't know the studio head at Edmonton, but I did find him on LinkedIn. Uh, I did write him an email saying, by the way, for the last five years, I've been working on a solution to the vision alignment problem. If you'd like to know about it, just let me know. He never got in touch. So if he's listening to your podcast, <laughs> I, just, I just want him to know, I'd love to work with you, honestly, because my mission, while we're talking about studio vision and mission, my mission is to try and remove this problem from the games industry. I am trying to bring this solution, solution, let's call it that for now. My attempt at solving this problem, my mission is to bring that to the game industry so that that problem goes away and maybe we can work on, you know, other things that people are happier at work or maybe we see more creativity or, you know, less studio closure. Um, so I thought I'd work in my personal mission into this. It's not, it's not all bad news. I think there is some light, but as you know, the last 2023 has been a bad year for the games industry in terms of layoffs, despite, you know, we've had some great games. Yeah, the this year has been, uh, I mean, honestly, the last few years in general have been pretty amazing overall for, you know, just games released across a variety of platforms. And then also the, you know, emergence of all the platforms from 2017 with the Switch last year you know with the steam deck as well i think that's really opened up the you know world to gaming you know in a way that you know something like the switch never did and mm -hmm. you know obviously you know you've got your mainstream console you know playstation 5 you know xbox and then all the digital side of it as well and then you know vr but yeah there's definitely you know like a huge issue i think tech companies in general but especially you know game companies you know entertainment you know, companies where they're making games, they're making movies, and, you know, they get one big hit or they get two big hits. And it is like, oh, I, I mean, definitely they must get in their head that they can't do no wrong, you know, because, mm. you know, one big hit is one thing, but when they get like a few, two, three, and they scale up so big, so they're not understanding, like, the, you know, the leader, you know, the leadership isn't understanding every single aspect of the company anymore it's just too much for them to get their head around there's just so many moving parts and so many you know middle managers that are almost like going cowboy even though they probably aren't thinking they're going rogue that they're mm -hmm. doing almost like their own mini company within this company you know company and i'm sure that happened up you know bioware as well where you, they was just you know there were people there that probably shouldn't have been there they were tired and they justified their role and they basically was able to you know make themselves feel and you know, like make themselves seem relevant and you know required and needed for you know the project i remember reading a, a quote i can't remember what it was from i think it was part of some study or stat but it was that most mid-level managers add zero to negative value to the you know the company especially you know the you know the bigger the company gets and there was like if you can achieve a company where most of the mid-level managers provide zero value you're doing good <laughs> like because there's not, like so many provide negative value like having them there will actually make the company even worse and the performance of it and after working in some large companies and seeing how, so you know, sometimes, it, like I said, like you get almost like companies within companies and they have their own rule system, you know, they're, you know, operating, you know, however they want. 
and it's like having a mini CEO within a company, even though there is, you know, an actual CEO mm -hmm. and, you know, like, yes, yeah, so some of these mid-level managers and you think, you know, what value are they actually, you know, bringing them? And, you know, you know, that's a huge issue, but yeah, like talking mm -hmm. about companies like, you know, you know, Bioware, obviously, you know, they did Mass Effect, hugely popular, very successful. A lot of people loved it. Obviously, mm -hmm. even that franchise for, I say some diehard fans, you know, wavered a bit in, you know, probably with Mass Effect 3 and Andromeda mm -hmm. as well, because 1 and 2 was like, they just knocked it out of the ballpark. I, I mm -hmm. feel like Mass Effect 1 to 2, that was like how Uncharted went from Uncharted 1 to 2, but then I feel like Naughty Dog, when they went to number 3, to number four, to you know the um, I'm trying to think what the the female one was as well, the legacy one or what? yeah, lost legacy. Like, yes, lost legacy, and then obviously mm -hmm. that the collection as well. I feel like they just kept doing it well while still tweaking it and you know modifying it. Whereas a lot of companies they do, you know, you know sometimes they do they don't change enough and they just keep it the same. And then sometimes yeah. they change it so much that you think this is no longer. The game I remember, like uh, it, this, just feels like something totally, you know, different. And yeah, mm. you know, with Anthem, so, Bioware did. I remember seeing that game, playing the beta. You know, it just there was a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz. Obviously, a lot of money spent, and obviously, you know, EA, you know, with their overarching hand, you know, you know, having probably huge control over it, mm. and then it releases, it flops. And I remember before. You know, in no time, it was super cheap to buy, like really cheap. And then they announced like the servers are shutting down. Like it, it, it went mm. from the next big thing to it's dead. So, so there, there's two related problems I think you're touching on. So you're talking about, you know, as a company gets bigger, it feels like there's a, a company within a company. So we've probably mentioned the word culture a few times, but and culture, we, we can get to that. There's different models of culture, but. Generally speaking, for a large company, it's very unlikely that, that that company will have one culture. It's simply too big. So what you get is subcultures popping up. Mm. And those subcultures, you're quite right, will have their own norms or values. Uh, and, and they may even say different things as well about how they work and behave. So this is the natural tension. And because you get subcultures, what can happen is, well, you've got us and them, yeah. like the kind of the bioware problem you've got this labeling of oh we're the a team and you're the b team you know so that's that's definitely a clear example of subcultures they were separate uh, companies at one stage as well so that's not good but the, the the problem that goes with that is within a subculture you're also likely to see the vision of the game differing so if if a company hopes that its culture is transmitted equally across the whole thing which is unlikely but that's what they hope right that we are as one with what we're one culture you're probably not, but anyway, it's the same for the vision, which is, a, a, you know, teams usually think, okay, here's the vision for the game. It's in a GDD or it's in some sort of system where we can talk about it and discuss it or document it. Um, the problem still remains that people have to interpret that. So any, I was, I was going to say any large team, but I won't take that back and it goes far to say any team, I'll talk about evidence in a second, any team does not have one vision for their game. There is subvisions or variations in the vision among that team. And so the question really isn't, you know, um, do we have one vision for the game? It's really how, how many visions have we got? That's the question. Or how far is our vision apart? You definitely do not have one vision um, for your game. If you think that, the flag should be going up in your head that oh, we're definitely aligned. We're all making the same game. I'm absolutely sure. I have had leaders say that to me. And even though I've said to them, hey, I've designed this exercise that checks, it takes 20 minutes, do you want to do it? I've heard, I've had them say to me, no, I think we're okay. So it's like, okay, you're a leader and you're shutting down the, this core idea that's likely to save your team. Now, this is me thinking into myself, I would never say this to them. But it's just like, wow, you should not be a leader, that's problem number one. Number two, you're definitely not aligned. <laughs> you, you will have misalignment. The question you should be looking to figure out is how much misalignment have we got on my team? The evidence behind that, the final thing I'll say is, so when I was working on that exercise to figure out how can I 
pull out the idea of a game inside someone's head, say the creative director. So if I fly into a studio and I speak to the creative director and I make them do my exercise and I extract the idea into the structure that I use. And then I, I do the exact same thing with maybe the, the lead designer or maybe the, lead, the producer or head of art or head of production or whoever it may be. I will do that say five, 10, 20 times and I extract the vision of the game in this clear structure. And the way it does it, um, it basically decomposes the game into a certain way and then we can compare the results. So it's pulling out what you think in your head of what game you're making into a very clear representation that allows me to compare between people. And I've done that 50 something times now. So it's been through 50 teams, 50 game studios. Some of them are billion dollar companies, some are three person indie teams, from the biggest to the smallest. The one thing I will say is no team has been aligned. The question is always how much misalignment have we got? So if anyone is listening and thinking, you know, we're definitely aligned, um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Brain I'll, I'll, wrong I'll go as line. far to say, I promise you, you are not aligned. You should be asking how much are we misaligned and where is that misalignment? That's the better question. So what's been the most common, you know, causes for misalignment? By far the biggest cause, this will not surprise you, of all misalignment is language. So when I was working on, again, I'm going to call it my, my solution. I don't know what else to call it. So it's called the team alignment check or vision alignment check. When I was working on that, I thought in my naivety that that was the only thing I had to design. So I designed five questions that decompose the player experience of a game into a certain structure. And to try that out, I was flying, at the time it was pre-COVID, I was flying into a game studio somewhere in the world to try it out. And I would make some mistakes, like maybe, maybe I worded it wrong. Um, and I would I'd adjust that and then try it again. What I realized that as part of that solution, there's 10 common game design terms that's, that's part of that solution. And there are words that anybody listening to this will know, things like challenge, strategy, story, uh, progression, you know, things like that. Any, just 10 generic words that can be used to describe any game. And what I thought was, again, my naivety, that the, the professional game developers would understand what all those words meant and we could just get on with doing the exercise. But I very quickly realized that, oh, no, 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 that's not the case at all. In fact, most of the disagreements uh, or friction points or misalignments comes from someone saying, oh, that's what you think progression is. That's interesting because in my mind, dot, 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 it's something different. Or well, that's what challenge is, really? Or story, is that, what, is that what you're thinking? So what I had to do before I do that exercise, I created a thing called language alignment template. And, and I send that language alignment template out one week before I do the vision alignment and I say, hey, we're going to do this exercise as a team. Just so you know, I want you to get together as a team and align together what these 10 words mean. And even, even though I do that every time, it still happens on the call nearly every time that they still need to be refined every single time. So language, because uh, language is linked to your identity. It's linked to, you know, <laughs> we, we get into the psychology of people, but language is not as simple as the definition. It is not like that. So that was the biggest surprise was um, the, one of the reasons you're misaligned is you think you're communicating by using words, but you're, uh, this is a Francis Bacon quote, by the way, but so this is a 400 year old problem called the idol of the marketplace. And people think they're communicating. I told you so. Why didn't you hear what I said? You know, that's what people typically say is, of course, of course I communicated. I told them, I wrote it down. It's like, uh-huh. The question is, how was it interpreted? Mm -hmm. How was it received at the other end? Did you check that? And the answer is, no, I did not check that. That's hard because if you go into a meeting, and I'm sure you've done this, I've certainly done it. Someone says, okay, this is what we're doing. Does everybody agree? And people nod. This is a social psychology problem because you are, as someone going to admit, I bet you what's happening in that room is every person has a slightly different interpretation of, what of what's about to happen. Now, they think they're agreeing. Uh, that's the best possible outcome. They think they're agreeing. It's unlikely. It's going to be slightly different. But how many, terms have you, how many times have you heard people say, 
hey, can I just clarify? Because the way I interpret what you're saying is this. Because I rarely hear that in a meeting. And the problem is if you've got a mixture of a CEO with someone junior, well, that's not going to happen. The junior person is very likely to go, hey, um, I don't get it. Could you just tell that to me again? Um, these things, again, this is social science problems, right? These things are working against you. This is the problem why it's not just me saying it's language. It's, well, why is language difficult? What are all the problems that come with this word language? Well, someone has to clarify it. Well, how do you do that? Is that, that could sound threatening or challenging. Again, I've basically heard in my younger days of the game industry, uh, when I was first getting into it, people have even said to me, I'm going to paraphrase, but not by much. It basically people saying, don't you know who I am? As if to say, I'm this famous designer. Well, why are you asking me these simple questions? You know, Again, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but not that much, really. Um, I think the world is better today, but the social science problem is still there, which is if you have someone junior trying to clarify someone senior, that is not an easy thing to do. No, um, it isn't. And, like, and I feel like on top of that, now I know when... I, especially earlier on in my career, when I was in that sort of position, you almost feel like you have an internal scorecard of there's only so many times I can, you know, ask for clarification, mm. uh, you know, depending on who I'm talking to before they either f they, they think negatively, negatively of me, they think I'm, you know, dumb and stupid, uh, and that, you know, impacts my position here uh, and you know i think there is an element of you know truth to that because you know obviously it takes two to tango you know mm -hmm. you do get managers you do get people you know on different teams higher up especially that you know they'll say something and then if you ask for clarification like sometimes they'll just repeat what they've said and the person asking for clarification didn't say oh, I didn't hear what you're saying, you know, uh, mm. I think my ears were dirty. Like, that's not what they're saying. <laughs> they're, they're asking for, you know, clarification. Obviously, that might require you, you know, like if you was, you know, saying, okay, you know, on the application, we wanted to do this, this, this. And then that might say, okay, you know, here's an example from an application I've seen, or let me run through with some images or, you know, you know, changing the wording of it, but it does def, there's def, um, I think that's a, you know, a good, you know, you know, example of what society and humanity is like as a whole and a problem with, you know, humans where mm. somebody will say something and you'll just assume that everyone else knows what you're talking about. Obviously, it's a huge problem in, you know, when you're making products, games, you know, websites, whatever it is, especially when they're either fixed launch and, you know, it is it's like it's, it's a big event, obviously, you know, let's say like a movie or, you know, a game, for example, like there's plenty of examples of movies where you think that it had all the makings to be an amazing movie, like the characters, the potential for story, you know, the background, like it, the actors in there, like it, it had like the budget, like it, it had everything. And then you just like, how did they mess up so bad? And then, like, it's one of those things that makes the average person think, you know, I could do a you know better job. And mm. sometimes the average person probably could if they, <laughs> if it wasn't to that huge scale where it's just something at some point. And sometimes that's just people lower uh, at the lower part of the company where it's got so big and you don't you don't have control or sometimes just hire people you know let's say some sort of parent company having a control over it and and the thing is what people don't realize sometimes these higher powers these higher forces like parent companies they don't directly say you know do this they'll make an off comment and even if let's say you're the director of and i'm using a movie example if you, even if you're the director of a movie you'll know that, okay, I might be the director, but I'm working for this company and this company is owned by this other company and they've made a comment about them liking this other style of movie. I kind of know what they're insinuating here, that I need to do it like that. 
Uh, and sometimes, you know, obviously there's that confusion. And, you know, obviously, you know, we was talking about, you know, DIY earlier. And I remember there's so many times, and I know this is my fault, like I've been doing some DIY or moving stuff around the house. And I'll get someone to help me, like a family member. And it is a very, you know, I think another problem with people that you can get, you know, you know, you know, quick to, you know, judge or anger with someone, you know, especially that's close to you, uh, you know, compared to someone that you don't know, you know, obviously, you know, the element of comfortability does make you, you know, sometimes too comfortable, you know, with how you are, but like, uh, we'll be doing some DIY and I'll say, you know, li- you know, lift it up. Uh, and in my head, I know exactly how I want it lifted up at yeah. one angle. And then when they don't do it, you know, obviously they when when I look about look at it now, I'm like, they did lift whatever I set up, but it wasn't at the angle and the amount that I wanted, and they didn't hold it at the position that I needed it to be. So, and obviously they, especially when you're in an awkward position doing something like that <laughs> and you're sweating, it's hot, uh, you know, you know, it's getting late, <laughs> you know, you've got to wrap up, you're just like not there, not there, you know, especially when you're holding something that's heavy and you've got to, you know, get it done quickly, you know, it's like no no lower, lower. Like, you, you do do you, there's definitely an element of, oh, I'm not giving, you know, ac- mm-hmm. adequate instructions, but in the t- moment you're like, I've told you to lift it up in my head, that means do it like this. I, I love that phrase you used in my head. So that that is the all my work is pretty much in that area <laughs> area of what is inside your head and your team member's head, and the things that I design, the tools that I design, are designed to surface what's inside your head, your head in a safe way, so that everybody knows. I guess you would say it's common knowledge, right? So as you say, imagine you could articulate, you know, lift it up, and the, the other person magically knew exactly what you were thinking and they lifted it at exactly the right speed and angle and to the final position just what you imagined wouldn't that be marvelous if that could happen <laughs> it would have helped now, a lot with DIY <laughs> with it, that didn't do that. so that's the work i do for the games industry which is to say the game in inverted commas is inside each of our heads and what i what i want all you this team to happen is when we say make the game all the pieces move at the right time in the right place to the right position so that we all have the same version of the game in our head. That's the problem that I that I try to solve, that one problem. I don't do very much. I just try to solve one problem. <laughs> but as you say, each person in their head has an interpretation of this is what I think will happen. And if this happens, the world is good. But it never happens because no one ever checks. <laughs> no. What was inside your head when you said, you know, um, the game is going to be immersive and fun or we're going to have a skill tree or we're going to have, you know, a progression system here or, yeah, these things are designed, but they're never quite what's inside people's heads, you know. Um, the other thing you made me think about was, um, you know, you've got some maybe junior trying to speak to someone senior is, I think people are maybe bad at listening generally in game studios. They haven't, they really need to go on a listening course. And there's a concept in at London School of Economics that we talked about uh, in class called voicing. And voicing means how are people on your team trying to tell you information? So let's imagine, for example, me and you are at senior levels in a company and we've known each other for a very long time. So I can say to you very directly and clearly, Prahan, this isn't working. We need to try the second system or an alternate method. And you'll be like, yes, Graham, let's try an alternate method. So me and you... We're equal power in the company and we've known each other. We have no problem communicating like that. Let's imagine a different scenario where you've got a junior producer in and they're trying to alert, you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, the COO or CEO or game director about a major problem that they've seen in the pipeline or whatever it may be. And they say something like, um, do you think there's maybe an issue with the, the pipeline process here? So listen to what they're saying. Do you think there's maybe a problem? Like they're not saying there is a problem. They're just saying, do you think there's maybe, or could we look at that again? So that sounds like they're not sure. And it's easy to dismiss, right? The senior person might say, well, they don't, they're not sure if there's a problem. So maybe I'll just ignore that. But this is a power problem. The junior person's trying to be polite. This is called voicing. Mm. It's how do you, how is that person trying to negotiate the politics in the workplace to raise the issue? 
I will be direct with you because me and you are equals. But the junior producer is trying to tell the CEO, hey, I've def- they are sure, by the way, this is definitely a problem. <laughs> um, and ideally, they would say this is a problem and we should fix it. But the voicing s- makes it sound as if, well, they're not so sure, so I'll dismiss it. And then, of course, two months later, the thing blows up and someone says, why did no one tell me? You know, this is clearly a problem and we should fix it. It's like, well, if they were better at listening, don't put all the blame on the junior person. That's not that's the bad solution. Right. That's not what we're saying. We're saying if you were better at listening, you would be able to identify that this is a voicing problem. I'm hearing them trying to raise something. I'm aware that there's a politics, a power difference between me and them. And I'm aware because of that, they may speak differently to me. Okay, with that knowledge, I can listen better. I've heard them say, I think there might be a problem with dot, dot, dot. But don't just go on the raw information and text. Let's bring the power play into the situation. They don't they don't want to, you know, um, it's very difficult to raise some, something to someone senior. So I'm better at listening now. I can ask a better question. Well, what are you seeing? What are you seeing that you're not sure about? Maybe we can look at it together. And what do you know? It definitely is a problem. and We can fix it today. So this is, this is listening, right? Um, the amount of leaders who probably went on a listening course or who are aware of voicing or who are, who are factoring in politics or the power play into you know, the, the, the dynamics in, in, in meetings. I mean, if you're just going on what's said or am I doing inverted commas here, data, information, then you're probably making pretty poor choices on a consistent basis. Oh yeah, like the you know having those you know people in companies you know it is a very difficult dynamic when you are junior and that could literally mean you're like a junior programmer or you know mm-hmm. you're just new like you know you could be you know forty years old but if you're new and you've got people you're in a meeting with five other people one of them let's say is a CEO and then the other four have been there for ten plus years. And you've only been there for a week, you know. You there's definitely an element of you thinking, okay, you know, how much do I want to, you know, rock the boat? Because mm-hmm. you know the way humans are wired up, we were easy to get offended. You know, it's like, why did they say that? Like, how dare they, you know, question us? We've been running the ship for so many years, and it's working fine. Obviously, in their heads, it's working fine. And uh, so, so yeah, there's a, de- definitely an element of brushing other people's opinions, you know, to the side. That's if they even, you know, get the courage to say, you know, okay, there is this issue. And then, you know, that point that you raised that uh, a lot of people, especially juniors, you know, at the lower level, will phrase it in a way where they're unsure. But mm-hmm. like you said, sometimes they're sure like they sure. know it's an issue yeah. but they're not going to say oh yeah i'm new i'm 22 years old just graduated you that's 45 years old that created this company this company is worth 50 million and you've got a thousand people and you've got you know five other people in this room that have two decades of that, that are more experience than i've had years on this planet there's something wrong and i've identified it like that's what they're mm. going to hear a lot of people will when it's said to them and that's kind of what the person who's you know figured out that there's a problem in mm-hmm. their inner you know monologue is telling them that okay if i say this they may interpret it that way and that's the thing because it's it's a may it, they may not um yeah. but and the other thing is you don't know what type of day let's say the ceo is having that you know on a good day he might be all right he might be receptive on a bad day, it might be from receptive to okay, you know, he's not going to renew your contract in three months. <laughs> like mm. th- that's obviously another huge, you know, problem with you know the workplace dynamics and you know psychology as well. Is that people aren't the same every day? You get ups and downs, and sometimes it's hard to tell. Because if it was, okay, this person's always going to negatively react or this person's always going to be positive, you know, you figure those things out in the first few weeks or months and then, you know, you proceed, you know, you proceed accordingly. Uh, and you say, okay, this person I can't raise certain issues with because it's a no-go. This person I can't raise them with because they're going to be receptive to it. Whereas 
you don't know what's going on in the day. It could just be work related. They could just be having a bad day. They might <laughs> they might be feeling bad about I don't, know, I don't know. Maybe they're a bit overweight and they feel they're feeling bad about it, or they've gone to some school reunion and there's a bunch of people there that they hung out with and they're doing much better than them and they're feeling self conscious about that as a result and their let's say lack of success yeah. in comparison. None of that is the let's say the junior's problem, but it ends up becoming their problem because we as humans won't say okay oh there's this thing in my life or in my head that's you know not the way i want it i'll leave it at you know me or let's say some close confidence whether that's you know a spouse whether that's friends whether that's you know let's say a father or a mother or you know a psychiatrist for example uh, and i'll discuss it with them but when i'm at work i will not let that impact my work and the way i interact with my work colleagues that never Mm. happens so that's a huge issue as well there's a few things there actually i'll just try me through them so the first one you you were talking about the difference between you know it's almost like organizational culture versus climate so climate is um like someone who feels bad today but you know maybe they're like that every day or maybe it's a one-off so you've heard of organizational culture. Uh, again, there's different definitions of it, but as culture is broadly speaking stable. An organization's culture is slow to change, but it can be changed. Climate changes often, <laughs> which is, you know, say the, uh, let's take a current example as we speak today, unity, right? The unity's culture or, uh, is, has been maybe stable for years. The climate today, the feeling within unity is probably climate of uncertainty, uh, tension because of the recent announcements. Um, so this is like your mood versus your personality. You're, how are you feeling today? Well, I had an argument with my partner, things aren't going well. Tomorrow, it's all back to normal. Your personality is relatively stable, but your mood can change on a day per day basis. An organization is no different. And that's why you may see things like, we did a, a culture survey and you only need to do a culture survey maybe twice a year. It doesn't change that much. A climate survey, how do our employees feel today? That could change on a weekly basis. You know, the stock price went down, we laid people off, we did a merger and acquisition, you know, we announced our new game, everyone's on a high. That could change all the time, you know, and this is why if you know, if you know your workmates, if you know how they normally are, you can spot these irregularities like, oh, they're not talking today, they're very quiet. That's not like them because they haven't been that like that for the previous 300 days, you know. So then you can, you know, spot these differences. The other thing that makes me think about like this sort of this difference between organizational culture and climate, we're almost getting at knowing your workmates. And there's a concept that emerged after World War II. It's called T groups, and the T stands for training. And what they realized is that after the, the Second World War, that people just wanted to talk to each other about problems life was difficult and these were people from different companies they weren't related they weren't weren't working on the same problem but people were coming together um just to talk just to meet up and to talk about their day and what was on their mind and this was enormously helpful and then the idea came about well if these people are meeting up and they're all just you know random people but they're finding value psychological value um and then discussing why don't we take that idea and bring it into the organization so, so this is from the Tavistock Institute in London. This idea was, you know, well, what if we bring that into the workplace where people just talk to each other? It's not a, it's not about a work-related item. It's not about what are you working on? It could be, it doesn't have to be. I have done this actually with some people in companies and they've said things like, you know, it's just nice to talk. Sometimes they talk about their family. Sometimes they talk about the pressures of work. Sometimes they talk about their life trajectory, how they got to that position where they would like to go next. Sometimes it's friction in the workplace. It's anything. It's what's on their mind. And I've even had people say things like, we never make the time to do this in work. We never take the time to talk. I've been on meetings and I've asked people to introduce themselves because I'm there for the first time. And I've even had people say, not only is it the first time they're meeting me, it's the first time they're meeting their colleagues like in a video call. They've never met them before. It's only been via email. So when we go onto a Teams call or a Zoom call, they're like, oh yeah, that's what you look like. That's interesting. So they just don't know each other. Um, and a lot of the workshops I run, like people, regardless of the content and the purpose that were there, 
I have been out of meetings and very little has been written down sometimes, but a lot of discussions happened. And that discussion is really important. People want to say things. It's important that they say things about how the company is working or running or not working or their aspirations. But I feel, I feel somehow that companies aren't valuing that. It doesn't sit well on a, a spreadsheet. It's like, really, you set aside half an hour just to talk? Can we afford that? Can you afford not to? Yeah, it's, no, this is a, it's, it's a crazy one. I've been in contracts you know, before and like the end of a sprint or at the start of a sprint, they're talking about like they'll have some graph and they'll look at it and be like, okay, you know, X amount of work items were achieved and X amount of work items were created and were, you know, on the predicted line of the graph, you know, so it's looking good. Uh, like, okay, that's good to an extent, but like they, they're like so much focus on, you know, making sure work items are ticked off and closed. Like the like I've been in, you know, coming before where they'll be like, okay, even if the work items not effectively done, we're nearing the end. You know, basically create a new work item. That's because you know half the work's been done, and you know mark this one as you know completed, and then you just pick up the next one. You know, pick up the you know the last part of it in a separate work item as like a successor work item in the next sprint so again so it looks good for the graph and <laughs> you know but you know it's it's a very common thing you know those mm. sort of practices where it's just and it, it'll be because you know we're part of a team that's part of a company that's part of a bigger company and might even yeah. be another step beyond that and then the parent companies are you know all, all they're looking at is graphs probably probably like the somebody's looking at it for 20 minutes you know once a week and they're like okay things are going okay there and then the person from that company like the ceo from the smaller company ha, it, it, you know has to justify you know certain decisions but like, okay you know things are going good as a result we can allocate funds or we can approve a certain you know decision that you're gonna you know make in terms of a product mm. announcement in terms of like a hiring decision that you're gonna do so it's definitely very I mean, scary in a way, like how companies do operate like that. And it is very much, okay, we need to, you know, tick off. And just, instead of being like, okay, it's Friday, we're going to have a meeting for an hour. We're just going to talk. like, mm. it, And that is it. And if some work, you know, discussion happens, that's fine. But that's not the purpose of the discussion. But this isn't like lunch like your lunch break, for example, obviously, let's say, if even, especially even if it's online as well, like we're just going to take the time, we're just going to talk what people are going to do on the weekend, you know, what interests you of, you know, like, you know, like the iPhones just come out today, you know, like, you know, you know, you know, talk about that, especially if you're part of a tech company, like, I think if you're not actively engaging in discussions of, tech and industry one i think that can have a negative impact on you as a company just from this point of view that you and the people you work with may not be up to scratch with what's actually coming especially you know with something like ai for example and but the other thing is like why are you not interested you know in if you're in the in a tech company and you're in a tech role for example why aren't you just having an hour conversation on a friday on a monday where that's all it is like the there's no purpose beyond just listening and talking about tech or listening and talking about sports if you know people happen to be you know into sports for example and there's not enough of that because you know you, i'm sure you've been on a call where let's say there's 10 people joining and you know you join before everyone else has fully joined and a few people might you know have a bit of a conversation might be like you know how are you you know what you're doing on the weekend or what did you do on the weekend or you know mm. did you see this and like once everyone's joined then like people's tones change and it goes to you know professional mode and, mm. like, and i feel, feel like there needs to be calls where instead of it being five percent you know just general human talk and 95 percent work needs to be switched where it's 95 percent human talk and maybe five percent work or if you want if you want to go more online something like the pareto print you know principle mm -hmm. 80, 20 you know having something like that instead mm. of saying that no, every meeting has to be work related I mean, I guess the theme we're really discussing here is, you know, how should people work? Why do we come together as a team? 
to achieve a task and how can you increase your chances of finding a team or joining a team or even creating a team that you know is is the is a nice environment to be in this kind of brings us full circle where i kind of i was half joking in a way saying you know the first person should be the organizational psychologist at a company to set the tone but this is kind of the the point i was getting at in a way by saying instead of just saying hey we're going to start a new company and we'll know we'll be successful because we're going to measure the progress of the product development but you probably heard of the concept of a double bottom line a double bottom line says yes we have to make the thing we have to report how much money we're making or whatever it may be but in addition to that that, that single bottom line the, the second one is going to be staff happiness if that could you could choose to build that into your company this company is only successful if we deliver products and make money uh, and we'll track those things but if our staff are miserable doing it then we're not successful that's not a successful company and that's also back to what the bioware staff were doing on anthem they were saying i think it was in dragon age uh, although the reviews were mostly good the the staff reported that they wanted the game to fail because they wanted to send a message to the leadership saying no this way of making games is ruining us we are not happy delivering this product if you only looked at the outcome which is you know um mass effect andromeda let's say got good enough scores dragon age got good enough scores um that's not the metric you should be looking at the metric you're missing is how happy were we when we were making the game and we're not happy at all <laughs> but you're not factoring that in so again if it doesn't sit on the graph it's kind of this this bioware magic ah they'll figure it out they're happy you know they'll make it work no no they're not happy you know but but the graph looks good we made money we got it done reviews the number looks pretty good people are happy well apart from the people who make it obviously but the you know the higher ups are happy so this double bottom line this is factoring in the future of work or how do we work and trying to get rid of this whole view that you know yeah we'll just get experienced people we'll chuck them in a room we'll make a product if the roi looks good and the graph's going to the top right then hey that's okay right like really is that how you want to spend you know 40 years of your working life i don't think many people do uh, and we saw that during the especially during covid where people were let's say taking time off to reevaluate like is that it am i just doing it for the paycheck can i not do a job where i'm also fulfilled and helping the world like some sort of and also know. have some flexibility as well i think that's also another right. element that a lot of companies are lacking and that people want and i think they kind of you know even if they don't in because obviously you know we've you know you mentioned covid uh, you know because of that a lot of remote working has become possible the, you know the idea of it because companies saw okay it, it, it's actually working at least for now obviously we don't have the data of how is it going to be for a company that does it for 20 years for five years for 10 years you know consistently and has you know allows people to do you know remote working but i i, I think the you know stats will be good overall but in, because of you know remote working it's given you know people the ability to to be at home but i think it's not just like some people prefer the idea of being at home not going to the office and you know not you know not having to travel but it's also the freedom it's like okay if it's 11 a.m i've got no meetings work's not super busy if i need to just pop out for 20 minutes yeah and you know Mm -hmm. run some errand you know i need to go to the post office i can do that and kind of like nobody will know but i'll get the work done anyway Uh, but Mm -hmm you know i think we as a society and also you know employers need to make that normal that okay people have lives and they and the other thing is there, there's a lot of businesses out there and you know a lot of organizations where if you want to interact with them you can't interact with them uh you know 2 p.m on a saturday when you're free that they have like hours of like nine to five but if you're at work at nine to five how can you interact with them it's like you know, you know, banks are open like on a Saturday, for example. But you know, the, there are certain organisations. I mean, even some banks, they'll be like, okay, yeah, at, at five we're shutting, and it's like, but I'm finishing at five, but and I need to come and do something at the bank. Like, you know, you, you're not really accommodating the average person's, 
you know, life and, you know, work structure. So I think that's another mm. thing that, you know, needs to be tackled as well. Yeah, there, there are definitely pros and cons, but again, depending on the culture that you want to create and having an awareness of the advantages and disadvantages, it should help you, you know, it should help you make a, a smart decision about how to, to structure the company. I think some people just took an extreme uh, stance, either direction, that either we're doing it or we're not doing it, and a lot of companies settled on hybrid. Um, but again, it's like, I didn't often see the reasons why. I felt they were just reacting to the staff's whims. Like if the staff said, we're not coming in, it's like, okay, well, we'll do hybrid then. Um, then they kind of gave in without saying, these are all the reasons why. This, this is the trade-offs that we're making. But it's, I mean, this links as well to diversity. I mean, so one of the advantages is, as you say, some people maybe cannot um, join a company. Maybe you can't get to that location or that time. So when we did hybrid or fully remote, it did enable uh, um, to hire people you previously couldn't, for example. Um, so the, there, there are certainly lots of advantages. Um, and that links back to the, especially creativity in the game industry, where we are definitely, um, you know, there's, there's lots of research on diversity and innovation. And we're aiming for that. That is that is a goal. We're actually seeking that out. So if, if anything in the game industry, you know, that it should be welcomed. Oh, yeah. So like one thing I want to, you know, touch on now is, you know, your background from an, you know, an educational standpoint, because you said you're, you know, you're retraining, uh, mm. you know, at the London School of Economics. And like, I'm on your LinkedIn profile now. And cause what interests me is that, You've got a degree in software engineering. You know, mm -hmm. you got a bachelor's uh, in that, and that was in the early, early to mid nineties. Then, in the late nineties, well, you know, after your bachelor's, you did a PhD in you know computer science. So you went very far. Like, I, I mean, I guess as far as academically you can go within a field like obviously you can be you know just have a whole career within university for example and just doing research but outside of that just in terms of like a degree standpoint you went as far as you can really go within one field without doing multiple degrees what yeah. made you want to retrain because you wasn't in a field where let's say it was some sort of physical trade that it's <laughs> going where I, I know computer science is changing especially with AI, especially with, you know, web-free technologies, but it's not dying. As a, you know, computer scientist, there's plenty of, let's say, jobs out there. So yeah. like, what made you want to retrain? Um, my retraining started a long time ago. So you're right, I finished my PhD in 1999. So my, my PhD was in computer graphics. It was kind of image compression, so low-level computer programming. Um, and then I had a job briefly as a programmer, a network programmer, for a, for a telecoms company. Um, and I knew pretty quickly that I wanted to do something more creative. And a friend, I think he worked at Rockstar at the time, he wanted me to come over for an interview. Um, I didn't go for the interview in the end. I took a job back at university, so I went to be a professor. Um, we call them lecturers in the UK, but to our international audience, uh, I went back to be a professor in, um, it was a computer science department, but in music technology. So I was a computer scientist on loan to a music department. And my job was to teach music technology students computer science, like programming essentially, programming for audio. So that got the exercise both halves of my brain, let's say. I'm an amateur musician. Um, and um, yeah, as, as a computer scientist. But in that job, um, it was really, really quickly into that job, maybe a year, when uh, I was introduced to the field of human computer interaction. And the HCI, human computer interaction is the link or bridge between computer science and psychology. So that's more in video games, we see that more on the interface side. Um, also the experience side, we'll get to that. But um, so human computer interaction is saying, how do you interact with the product? And we had a guest lecturer from, from uh, South Africa University, and he was talking about how some of the local people in South Africa use mobile phones. And all of this was about how they use the phones. There was zero, the technologies of no interest here. Uh, it's more about how they use it and the problems they have in using it. And it was fascinating. It was a million times more interesting than programming. So I was sitting there as a computer scientist going, well, that's interesting. What he's talking about 
far excites me more than writing more code, which I've done for 10 years by this point, you know? So I was like, well, what field is that? And that was human computer interaction. So I almost, the next uh, 10 years, I went from Queen's University, Belfast, hence the accent, to University of Sussex in Brighton, uh, where I live now. Um, that whole era of my life was human computer interaction. But when I moved to Sussex University in Brighton, I knew that I wanted to start an HCI company for the video game industry. And I knew that the game industry was very, this is 2007, the game industry was very active in Brighton, even then and, and today. In fact, my very first meeting when I got the, the job at, at University of Sussex was not to meet my head of school or any academics. My very first meeting was with, um, uh, with a game studio um, in Brighton. And so I knew very, very clearly the reason I'm here is to bring academic knowledge into the game industry, because that's the problem that I saw was the same as yourself, probably when you're playing games, console games from the you know, um, mid 2000s era, actually any era, <laughs> pretty much, they're full of usability problems. What am I meant to be doing? Why does it not tell me that? How does this work? I didn't know you could do that. These are all usability problems. Games That's were making all these mistakes. Problem with, like, when I go back and play some older games, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, I was like, you know, you have to do that. I, you know, uh, like, like now there's, you'll get almost like a whole level and it's just instructions. Whereas back then it'll be like, okay, the game started. <laughs> like, see, you, you, exactly. you, you won't be told that X is to jump, you know, this is to shoot. Like, you'll just be like, okay. You, you know you know if you don't you're gonna press buttons you're gonna figure it out and yeah. like those games did well like they, they were top tier games yeah. obviously you know the industry has you know definitely you know changed especially as you know testing has become a huge part of the development process in the early days we'll the developers that. were the testers they did some testing it worked but because they were testing as they were developing they obviously knew the control scheme, so they, I guess, never saw a need to document that in an instructional, you know, point of mm -hmm. view within the game. But now, yeah, there are instructions, and uh, and obviously, you know, uh, as an extension, you've got YouTube as well, which you know you mm -hmm. didn't have back then as well. And I think, like, how the how did we, you know, play games? And then sometimes you go back and play games, and not only do you have that problem of there's not enough instructions. You know, just the way the game plays, just is it's just rubbish. <laughs> like, this, exactly, this, that's the this, bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, like it's just rubbish. Like I'll play games, and I'm like, I was playing games with low to mid twenty FPS. Like, what? How the hell was I even enjoying this? So I don't, I don't get involved in the technical side. So frames per second, for example, it's not doesn't really fall into uh, usability or user experience. Well. Arguably, it is user experience if it's a low frame rate. I get it, but that's a QA problem in the game industry usually. Or... Plus, if that's the industry standard at the time, you overlook <laughs> that. Like in PS3 era, 30 FPS was very standard. 60 FPS wasn't really much of a thing on consoles outside of something like Call of Duty. But it, whereas with PS4 and now PS5, 60 FPS is a huge thing now, and obviously they have the quality and the performance modes. And on PC, you know, it's 120 FPS. It's you know, yes. 240 FPS, like, you know, for those high, you know, refresh rate margins. Yeah. So, yeah, it really does depend on, you know, the time. So, obviously, at the time, that's what the console games were. So, we never... Yes, but the game's also designed in a way where it kind of accommodates that, you know, the pace of it. Yeah, so it's... We would never look at frames per second or anything like that. So, that's outside the area of human-computer interaction. You're right. The bit we would look at is the game design, which is... Here's a game that someone's designed, you know, spent one or two years designing and making. Is it fun? Is the player enjoying this in the way that the designers hoped? So that is a question very firmly in the human computer interaction, you know, domain, let's say. So the ramp, the round, they join these stories together. I quit my academic job and started a company doing playtesting for the game industry. So the, the field of playtesting is called user research. And user research has lots of methods, and one of one of them is playtesting. And playtesting by itself, it's kind of a generic term. It can mean lots of, back to our language problem, playtesting means different things to different people. So I'll just give some definitions here of the types we did. Broadly speaking, when it comes to game design, uh, there are two types you would probably get involved with, or my company would have done. 
One is usability, which means do you know how the game works? The sort of the rules, the logic, the systems. Can you do it? Um, the understanding, the feedback, the interaction. It does not answer the question, do you like it? That would be called appeal playtesting or gameplay. It's got different names. So you very much split these questions apart. A lot bore you with the reasons, but so either you're looking at the usability, do you know how this game works? Or you're looking at the question, do you like the game? And so um, that was me trying to take what academia knew about the link between the brain and the, the interaction, like the controller and the interface on the screen and how it surfaces those things. We were doing that for the games industry. That was, that was the company that I founded. Um, but in that job, um, that's what led me to my current job in team alignment or vision alignment. Because I was lucky in that job that I got to meet about or speak to, I estimate about three to 400 studios a year. So if I'm going to a conference, for example, like Game Connection in Paris or Gamescom, you know, I'm maybe speaking to 50 studios uh, over the course of that week or those few days. And then the rest of the year you're speaking to whatever else. So I was very lucky. I got to speak to hundreds of studios a year and I got to ask them a, a core set of questions, one of which was, tell me what game you're making. And what I realized was, depending on who I asked in the studio, I would get a different answer. So if I speak to the producer, hey, tell me what game you're making, or the programmer, or the lead artist, or the CEO, what game are you making? I might get a similar answer, but it wouldn't be the same. And I always found that interesting. And so I had I kept a list. Um, oh, it's called problems I see in the game industry. <laughs> I still have the list, by the way. So that was at the top of the list, which is why does that happen? Like I wasn't there to solve that problem. I was there to do playtesting to figure out is this game interesting? Are people enjoying the game? But I couldn't get over the fact that this problem kept coming up, regardless of how experienced the team was, regardless of where they were in the world, regardless of what platform they were on. You know, it didn't matter. This problem was universal. So I sold that company in 2016. I left a few years later. And then I returned to my list thinking, why does that? I just wanted to know why does that happen? And one day I Googled for a solution, just said, well, how are other people doing it? How are they solving this team alignment problem? And I couldn't find it. So I looked deeper and I couldn't find it. And it turns out there isn't really any solution to that problem. So from that period, from 2018 till today, five years, that's the one problem I tried to solve, which is my team alignment check, these five questions. That was the origin. So I, did, I didn't set out to retrain. It was like, I was a, an academic in human computer interaction. I was then a, a company founder for the game industry in user research or human computer interaction. And then during that job, because I got to interview or see lots of the game industry, that problem just presented itself. It was like, why does that keep happening? And I think that problem's tripping you up. And so when I left, that's the problem that I solve today. Um, and my current mission is to, I don't know, somehow release that to the game industry. You, again, we're talking right in the middle of this. <laughs> it's an interesting time, right? It's, so if we meet in five years, we'll see what happened, you know, how, uh, how I got it out there. But oh, so yeah. that's the origins of going from, you know, bachelor's in computer science, PhD in computer science, programmer in networks, um, academic in computer science, half music, uh, academic in human computer interaction fully, company founder in the game industry and games research. And then, so that, I, I think of that as product, by the way. So applying research to make a better product, a better game. Whereas what I do now is applying research to make a better team. And if we had a met 10 years ago, I would have told you players first. It's all about being players first. From where I stand now, um, I think that's wrong. And I would say team first, because if the team's not happy, you're, you're not going to get to the, the bit after that, which is the players are happy. The, the team has to come first. So you'll probably hear me say in future talks or whatever that, you know, the game industry's kind of got it wrong. All these companies who say we're players first, I kind of think that's a mistake. And I wish they would say they were team first. Okay. And 
So, you know, with all this, you know, retraining and, you know, the shift in your career, how has your fam, you know, family taken? Because, like, you know, are you married, kids? You know, like, how has that been? Because, you know, when you're younger, let's say you're 25 years old, you decide to mm-hmm. change, you know, your career, let's say, you don't have any dependencies, you're not, obviously you're not older, you're not in the later stages of your career. It's not that big of a deal. Even at the time, it might seem like it, but it's not. Whereas when you're old and you've got a family and, you know, maybe a mortgage and all that sort of stuff, like, it's, <laughs> it's definitely harder. That's definitely one of the reasons why people don't. Yeah, so I, I am quite old. I'm 50 this year. I've just turned 50. So I'm, you know, um, I don't know how to phrase this really. But let's say, I don't want to say later stage, but I, there's a few things. So yes, I'm moderately old, definitely a middle-aged guy. Um, but I'm also lucky, right? Because I can choose to work on the problems that I want. I don't, I don't have to work for a company if I don't want to, you know. So my position is different than some others, where I realize that you know your decisions, the influ- what's influencing your decisions may be different than what's influencing me. Um, so I, I still feel in some ways like um, kind of like an academic in some ways. Because I, I get to choose these interesting problems and I have time to think about them and time to release them into the game industry in the way that, that I want. Um, so I think my path, is, <laughs> my path is maybe a bit more unusual than most. Um, I might end up working for a company again, but I would find it probably unlikely. Uh, but who knows? Okay. Uh, so, you know, that's like all the questions that I've got in terms of, you know, your career and obviously, you know, how you've progressed. You know, what I always do at the end of each of my podcasts is do a rapid fire, you know, fun round where, you know, you know, to, you know, wrap it up. But before we do that, I do have one more question for the listeners out there. You know, with your, you know, two, three decades of experience retraining, you know, seeing a lot of different stuff and, you know, being in a slightly different you know, career now compared to what many mm. people are in, what advice would you give to someone that's coming out <laughs> of university with all the advancements in technology, especially like AI? Like, how would you, you know, because obviously that's definitely an important thing is your values, you know, how you want, what yeah. you want from life, how you want to be happy. So like, what advice would you give for someone? Oh, it's all, it's always dangerous giving advice, isn't it? So uh, <laughs> please, please don't take my advice. I'll, I'll say that. But I can tell you um, maybe one of my values, I guess, which is um, I've always done things that I thought I would enjoy. That's pretty much been a constant going back from like a teenager to today. So that, that value is held for 35 years. And what it means is if I've left something, if I've stopped doing something, it probably means the enjoyment either diminished or and there was greater enjoyment somewhere else. The one, I, I can't tell, I mean, a graduate today, my classmates are all 21 years old. You know, uh, London School of Economics, I think, is the most international university in the UK, uh, maybe even in Europe. So the students from all around the world, um, I, I wouldn't know what advice to give them, but because the future is very uncertain, what I would say is, be open to change or be open to the idea that you may not be right. Um, I guess the word we would use in psychology is maybe resilience. You know, can you, can you be open to change uh, and changing your mind, changing your career um, based on new information or how you feel? But if you're going all in on one thing and that one thing doesn't work out, either because of something outside of your control or inside, who knows? Then you may get unhappy. Like it may, you know, may not be to your advantage. But if instead you can say, "Well, I think this is the current path I'm on, but um, I understand that I have transferable values and I can go multiple ways. And if one doesn't work out, then maybe I'm just as happy going somewhere else." You know. So I think resilience is a good quality to have, especially in an uncertain world. Um, so if you can think about that, just and not maybe not get too fixated. The flip side I understand is fixation can drive um, innovation, maybe, and you know, seeing things through commitment. There's always a flip side to these things. So. Yeah, I mean, it's all relative, obviously. You know where you are. 
you know, at the stage of your life, you know, what you want to achieve. Because I feel like entrepreneurship and let's say, you know, startups has been very glorified in movies and in so on social media these days that like everyone wants to be an influencer, everyone wants to be a YouTuber, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Whereas I don't think a lot of people, especially younger people out there, sit there and think that, okay, do I actually like if let's say I can make a success of it, like do I actually want to do what is required and mm-hmm. to do it day in, day out? Like, you know, th- the commitment versus like as I've got older, I, I've definitely appreciated the notion of not everyone is geared and set up to be, you know, a founder, you know, a co founder to start a company. That's not a bad thing. You know, you can, nothing wrong with working inside of a company, earning money that way, doing the nine to five. And then maybe you use that money for investing. Maybe you use that money for like, there's like this, you know, let's say if we're just talking about it from a wealth perspective, there's so many, you know, different avenues to take. You know, it doesn't have to be, okay, you have to not work at a company. You have to be a maverick. You have to, you know, do this idea, do this idea, you know, do, you know, do this startup that is, you know, totally different and out there. There's, you know, you can go the more typical path. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, on top of that, it is not, I do recommend university to a lot of people, but there's nothing wrong with picking up a trade. And I don't know that is frowned upon compared to having a degree, you know, you know, becoming a doctor, becoming a lawyer, even an engineer, something along those lines versus becoming an electrician or a plumber. If you're going to enjoy that more and if you're willing to put the work into it, you can do very well at that as well. So, you know, yeah, definitely being adaptable and knowing when, things are going wrong in however they are and being willing to change. I feel like a lot of people in life are, you know, they're driving a car, they're heading in a direction, but they don't know if it's the right direction. It's like, if you just get in the car and just start driving, you'll get somewhere, but is it where you want to be? And I feel like a lot of people end up, go in the opposite direction to where they want to go they at some point in some on some level in their mind realize that but they would rather keep going in that direction than admit they was wrong and do a u-turn and so here's a you know that's like a huge problem with people and it, society absolutely um, i was going to say that you know when i was looking at the research on this vision alignment and things like that um, one, of, one of the books i was looking at uh, was talking about an exercise maybe for your listeners is to do their own personal vision you know so imagine in five years time um what does your life look like and write it out it's called a vivid a vivid description vivid so for example one of the examples was uh, henry ford um made the motor car quite popular <laughs> so his vivid vision was something like whenever i am through there, there will be no horses on the roads um, and every man it was man at the time. Every man will be able to afford a car to go and you know see their uh, see their relatives or something like that. So he was painting a picture. Whenever I finished my vision of this motor car thing that I want to build, there will be no horses on the roads, and everybody will be able to afford one. At the time when he said that, that was crazy. I said, "What do you mean there'll be no horses on the roads? There were only horses on the roads back then." So this vivid description. Yes, it can happen for a company, but you can do it for yourself as well. So in 2028, what are you doing? Paint the picture. Uh, Painting doesn't mean with a physical picture. You're welcome to do that, of course, but it's with words. Try and write one to 200 words. Do it after this uh, podcast. What does your life look like? If you want to know what would guide you, you can then do your personal values. How do I decide whether to take path A or path B? Like I have my values. I'm not going to dis- discuss them, but they guide me. If someone says, do you want to do this thing? I will do a mental checklist of the values. And if I say no, it's because they don't fit. That's not the life I want. So having the vision will tell you where you want to go. It may change. That's fine. But paint it for five years away, sufficiently far away. And then to help you get there, write out three, four, at, m- at most five values. And you will do a sense check against these values. When someone says, hey, you could four job opportunities if you're coming out of university. Which one do you want to go with? Your value should be helping you decide. Well, look, three of these companies don't meet with me. Um, This one's the best fit. That should 
you know, help keep, I'm not saying it's foolproof, by the way, but it should help keep you po- understanding why do I want to do that job? If, if I want to be a founder, what you were saying earlier, ask the question, why do I want to be a founder? If it's just the identity, you know, I want to be seen as a founder, then that's probably not a great reason that may drift off. You know, if something more exciting comes along, you may go and do that. For example, I knew I was going to start a company and I was not, I never thought I was the sort of person to start a company. But I remember very clearly that I knew it was going to happen. I remember where I was standing. It was outside. I knew the exact weather conditions. I remember standing there and I knew this is going to happen. I'm going to start a company because the mission was what drove it, which is my mission at the time was who's doing play testing for the, um, the, let's say, less privileged game developers. So if you worked for an EA or a Disney or a Microsoft, you could afford to do user research. It was internal. It was paid for for you or taken care of, let's say. But if you're one of the other 99.9% of the game industry, well, you're out of luck. There was nowhere you could really go to to have high quality user research done. And I knew, well, I have to do that. And that was the thing that propelled me through the days when you, you know, maybe you're doing things you don't want to do, but the mission is the thing that, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. And I can do that for a very long time, regardless of the conditions. Uh, and my mission then, I'm not going to say it, but my mission then uh, at a higher level, I guess, is the same as today, you know, more or less changing how the game industry works to make people happier at work, um, that type of thing. Um, my mission is the same in that company that I founded as what I do today. The mission is identical. The way that I go about doing it is a bit different. In the past, it was for the product, uh, and now it's on the team, but the mission is almost identical. So I would encourage people, you know, if you're feeling lost, not just, not just to say, I want to be an influencer or a founder, or I want to be... I want to get a trade or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you want to do in life. Just do try to understand why, what, what is driving that? Because the underlying values may open up other possibilities for you. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, be open. And obviously when things, you know, come your way, you know, you know research it and, you know, be, be willing to have a go at, you know, new and different things. So, yeah. like I said, this is the time of that podcast, the, you know, the very fun podcast. <laughs> I, 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 and I feel like some people, you know, actually think more on these questions. So <laughs> uh, are you ready for the rapid fire questions? Go on then. Go on. Okay. So, you know, you are running your own company. If you had a choice of running a 10 person company or a 1000 person company, which would you choose and why? Oh my goodness. Um, my immediate answer is to say 10. Uh, maybe out of familiarity, maybe that's the bias here. I've had a 10 person company. Uh, that's the kind of size that we were. I liked knowing everyone. I personally find that a nice way to work. Um, I've also changed a lot from then to now, I would say. Uh, anyway, so the thousand person company, what I would say about that is um, that could be an interesting challenge. So I think you're getting something from each, right? It's hard to say either or. Um, but if I had to go to work and find value every day, I think I'd be asking you more questions, which is what do these companies do? What's their mission? Because I don't, you're making me think, apologies for talking and thinking at the same time. The number of people, I'm immediately gravitating to 10, but I think that's a mistake. I think I want to know what do these each of these companies do? Uh, and that would drive me, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely probably the, the first person that's, you know, analyzed it like that. You know, a lot of people are quick to say 10 or, you know, 1,000. And low insight, most people do say 10. The odd person does say 1,000 on the notion that if it's got to that scale, that things are ticking by and they must be, you know, but as we've discussed, it's not necessarily the case, but everything must be fine and, you know, money must be fine, like all that sort of stuff. That is that general assumption that obviously if you've got to 1,000 people, 10,000 people, a lot of the problems were solved, but not necessarily. It might just be ready to, you know, collapse. But then obviously a lot of people say 10 because they want to know everyone and they, you know, want to have that personal connection. But like saying, so, you know, you've got to analyze it of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, you know, that will inform your decision. Because obviously if you want to be a globalized, I don't know, fashion retailer, a brand taking on all of these, you know, big merchants and, you know, fashion companies, 10 people probably isn't going to do it. <laughs> like it's, I, it's, it's not really practical. <laughs> your question's clever because what, what it's really asking is, what do you value? Yeah. The fact that I have to answer that question, 
although I'm not saying them explicitly, like reading them out, you're making me think again, what's my values? What do I, what do I prioritize in life? How do I want to live my, what's my life design? Am I more likely to get that at a 10 person studio or a thousand person studio? So although my answer immediately was, I think my life choice would be more likely achieved at a 10 person studio. I could be really unhappy there because what's really driving me is mission. If that thousand person company is going to make a significant difference to the world, then I'm there. That's the one I'm joining. So again, without any other information, the answer is 10. With more information, that could completely change. You know. Okay. And you know, it, would you rather have five million pound a year or half a million a year for the rest of your life? So, no, sorry. Would you rather have five million pound upfront or half a million a year for the rest of your life, and why? Uh, up front, I think. Um, no one knows what's ahead. So I think a half a million is it's probably a better bet if you're a betting person. But if you wanted to create something with that five million, like start a company, maybe you couldn't do it with half a million, depending on what you want to do. But maybe three million might get you there. So um, yeah, uh, it's a tricky one. Both are good options. I would take either, <laughs> probably honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it, I guess, it's definitely a hypothetical one. Yeah, oh, Fahad, I thought you were offering. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if this podcast gets into the top three, I'll, 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 <laughs> I might flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is a triple one. Favorite board game, video game, and movie? Uh, I'm not a board game fan. Sorry to... to um... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, nothing against board games. I just don't. I think uh, you're probably, I don't know, the first or second person on the podcast where I've asked that question and they don't have actually a board, even if they haven't played it for a while, that they don't, yeah. that they don't play board games or haven't played board games. For, for, I mean, now, fair enough. See, but. the reason I play games is interaction, really. So, it's a, a similar reason why I don't really play mobile games is, you know, if you're, if you're interested in interaction, then you probably want. Uh, a bigger screen to output and more nuanced input controller. So, uh, and also the types of games, of course. Um, oh, so I, I can tell you the only game that I have put into my diary for release is Assassin's Creed Mirage, uh, which I think is the 9th of October. I should check my diary. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm playing Assassin's Creed Unity on my Steam Deck. Um, I have finished the game previously, um, but I want to play it again. <laughs> so I'm playing that. How's it running um, on the Steam Deck? Because I haven't tried that particular game. It's great. I locked it to 40 frames per second. All good. But it burns through the battery pretty quickly. <laughs> but I play in short sessions anyway. So you get about two hours of battery. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, the Steam... I mean, how are you finding now? Because I, oh, I it's love been it. a while since I played it, but I do love it, though. Oh, I, I love it. Because there's so many games that I can play in small chunks of time. Um, or sitting on the sofa or something like that instead of my PC. And yeah, I think it's a great device. I really recommend it. Um, uh, yeah, what else am I playing? I just downloaded the update for uh, Cyberpunk uh, for 2.0. Um, so I, I may give that a go. Um, I'm running out of time because I start back at university next week. So <laughs> I should be studying quantitative methods, but <laughs> uh, I don't know. Those sorts of things. Yeah, you can call this research. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I, I do, I still work for the game industry, so I have to you, you, um, you, play you, my you, clients' games. You need again. to know about the new Cyberpunk update so you can you know, discuss <laughs> it in your course. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you've kind of already touched on it, but, you know, what video game are you looking forward to the most? I think you mentioned Mirage. Yeah, I think Mirage is... Um, I know the Assassin's Creed games get... Um, uh, criticized quite heavily for being you know rinse and repeat more of the same but that's the actually the reason i like it to go to get a warm blanket it's a place i can go back to and the consistency yeah do some side quests you know uh choose the mission i want depending on time or i felt like um, valhalla well, like, how, how did you find valhalla because i've played all of the i say main assassin's creed not like you know like yeah. the china or russia one but you know like mm-hmm. all the you know main console ones mm-hmm. and you know valhalla I felt like the last two or three had dropped a bit anyway, but Valhalla was just like, ugh, like I just couldn't be bothered with it. It just, like, and I think that's the reason I'm excited for Mirage is that it is taking it yeah. kind of back to its roots. Exactly that. It's got, again, you know, set in Persia or Iran and you're playing, you know, Prince of Persia as a kid and things like that. And um, there's definitely the nostalgia thing there. Um, Valhalla, Funny you mentioned that one. I play. I tried it twice, 
I bounced off both times. Um, so I played the opening scene where it's set in you know, Scandinavia somewhere, and then you get to England. I, I Just when I got to England, it, it really, I did not like the opening of that game at all. I bounced mm. off twice, which is really rare. I thought I would... I just wish it would have started in England. I think that's the bit I wanted to get to. Plus the um, combat, I felt, was not quite what it used to be. I like. I feel like they changed the affair bit in terms mm-hmm. of the style of the game, and he was he no longer felt like an Assassin's Creed game anymore. Yeah, I loved Odyssey. Odyssey was the one I um, put a lot of time into. Uh, again, it's just for the world setting. I love being in that world. So I, I, that's what about Mirage. It's the same sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that, I think. But as probably like yourself, my, my Steam backlog is off the charts. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> the amount of games I have to get through, so... Oh yeah, um, and then on PlayStation, then, then all the ones oh, that are coming on PS Plus, and then Xbox yeah, Game Pass. Exactly. And well. I mean, it's kind of good that they're coming on PlayStation Plus on Game Pass. Like something comes up and be like, oh, I wanted to buy that anyway, but I've been so mm-hmm. busy with other games, I don't have to buy that now. I can just, you know, download it. And then sometimes I'll play it, I'll enjoy it, but then sometimes I'll play it and I'll be like, I'm kind of happy I didn't buy it. I can, you know, I can justifyingly, I can justify saying no and stop playing it versus be like, okay, I'll spend 70 pounds. Spend 70 pounds on it. And, you know, <laughs> having, I'll be like, okay, you know, I've got to kind of get through it now. Yeah, there's, there's some really small games I liked. There was one on mm. Switch called The Last Campfire, which was uh, made by Hello Games, who make No Man's Sky. And it was a bit like a, a palate cleanser, I guess, for them. You know, they worked on this game for a very long time and, I think it was made by a small team within the company, but and it's just so much charm. It's a really puzzle light game, um, but it really um, I don't know. It seemed to communicate human values. There's something about it that I felt very human. Um, so I, I recommend that if someone just like wants a, a small game, you could do it in maybe I don't know five hours. Maybe I'm misremembering, but it was short and it had charm as the word I would use. So I'm I really enjoyed that. Check that out because I do like some of the. I, I just had a quick look now on Google, you know, about it, and you know, I do like those sort of games, you know, like Journey and exactly. Flower, yeah. and you know, Firewatch, you know, the kind of indie mm-hmm. style, you know, games where it's just and it kind of soothing. It just makes you feel like almost like it's putting you to sleep, but not putting you to sleep, like relaxing you. Yeah. Like even so, after this call this evening, I'll probably play Assassin's Creed Unity um, for you know for 40, 50 minutes on the Steam Deck. And for a lot of times, I'm not actually doing the side missions or side quests or even the main mission. I'm just wandering around 18th century Paris because I like just wandering around 18th century Paris. It's it's interesting. And you might they say, well, it's not a waste of time, not actually progressing the game, or but I just like being immersed in that world. By the way, I, pro- I probably will do a side quest. But anyway, um, the world itself is enough. I get enough of, uh, you know, my needs are met. If we get into the psychological, <laughs> Plus, into the psychology. Plus, because you've played it and completed it, it's mm. kind of like, okay, you, you've done that, even though you've done you, it. Yeah. You're on a different platform. <laughs> like, you don't mind just exploring and, you know, yeah. just being there. That's so nice. But, um, what, do you, what are you looking forward to? Ooh. I mean, the Spider-Man. Coming out, or is definitely October, is it? I'm looking forward to that. There's plenty of games I'm looking forward to that are mm-hmm. out, but I just haven't got around to playing. I'm still, <laughs> I've, it's been a while since I've you know properly sat down and played some games, but I need to get back into Jedi Survivor. I need to uh, play yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, there's Far Cry 6, that's a bit old now. My, I finished that, that's good. Uh, I might co op that with my cousin you know, online. Mm-hmm. Or so might do this. We was looking for a game to you know play co-op where we used to play a lot of co-op games when we were kids, mm-hmm. and like, we used to play like couch co-op. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know that's definitely a dying breed now, especially for the hardcore games. Like, you're getting games like Moving Out and Overcooked and whatnot, uh, yeah. which is nice in its own right, like kind of party fun. But I am missing the days of you know you know. Halo co-op, Gears of War co-op, yes, Army yes, of Two, yes, yes. that sort of stuff. That generation, oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, you check out Endless Dungeon. Every generation, <laughs> that was the golden um, era. I was going to say, End- Endless Dungeon looks a bit like that. I'm not sure if it's couch co-op. It's four player, so it's kind of four player roguelike. Um, 
it's maybe not quite as extreme as you know army of two or gears of war yeah but... that got intense sometimes army of two did because obviously you know one person will grab you know when you was knocked down one person will grab you and you're shooting like the person that's being grabbed like you're shooting uh the other you know the enemies and you know there's there's a lot of trust there because you can't run away uh, and kind of flank. So yeah, there was definitely a you know huge element of trust, and then having like the shield and like going back to back, you know, you know with each of that. That's definitely a game I would love to see a remake or definitely a remaster mm-hmm. on. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, in that game, I, I would love that. Um, but other games I'm looking forward. To, I mean, there's so many games. I just just they're Too not many, coming to my mind right now. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's Spider Man Two definitely outside mm-hmm. of games that i've already got i mean if they ever get around to a half-life <laughs> oh, <laughs> the next yeah, half life. Yeah. obviously i know we had alex and that was great i loved it but you know just an you know just a regular half-life i think <laughs> valve is kind of an example of a studio you know when we were discussing bioware an example of a studio that's like okay we're not just going to release a game because we happen to have released a game or games that did well yeah, like, yeah. but they've definitely taken it to the extreme and they can because they've got Steam, so they're bringing in money anyway. So they there's, there's they don't have the incentive as much to be like, okay, we need to make sure we get a game out soon mm. because they're making more money in, in reality with probably less effort and less potential so, backlash, you know, yeah. that you know, with Steam. Like it, it's it's the de facto platform if you're on PC. Oh yeah, definitely. You you reminded me that I bought the Half Life One a remake, which I've just forgotten the name of. I bought it for Black Steam Deck. Mesa? That's the one. <laughs> so I bought it this this week or last week. I can't remember. And it's, it's, it's installed on my Steam Deck beside uh, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. So it's next on the list to, to go back and replay. Yeah. I, I, I need to get back and play because I remember it wasn't finished and then they had the update. I haven't, you know, pl- you know, completed it you know, as a result of that. I might, you know, put it on my Steam Deck as well and, mm. you know, have a go. I think Val has done an amazing job with the Steam Deck, obviously with the VR side as well on the high end, but the Steam Deck and the price point, like, what's the lowest one? Is it three fifty? That's less, maybe. It goes, yeah, maybe it is three fifty. I can't remember. Yeah, about that. Yeah, and like the fact that with the micro SD card, you get like virtually the same performance in most games. Like, there's, yeah, it's it's virtually hardly any. It's the same. I, I think. Yeah. Maybe the high end model, what does it have an anti glare screen or something? Like <laughs> Apparently that? so, but it's very subtle, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've got the you know the higher end, the 512 gig one anyway, so I haven't seen a comparison. But I mm. think most people, if they like, you, you, I'm sure I've seen your marketplace under 300 or on eBay, for example. So, you know, what you can get with a Steam Deck and how optimized it is, and if you've got any sizable Steam library, like. It is just buy it. It yeah. is amazing, like what it provides you. It's like having a console in your hands and having all those games. Plus, because there's always sales on. Plus, if you hit platform like CD keys, or, you know, um, <laughs> don't even start. You know, humble bundle. It's like you, you, you can get a lot of games real cheap. And um, the, one of the reasons I got it as well uh, is for the emulation of. Um, I had lots of other consoles, like mm. retro consoles. And yeah. I got rid of all of them. They all went and replaced with the Steam Deck. So, oh yeah, like the yeah. it does emulation really well as well, especially yeah. like the PS2 era. I mean, I've done some PS3 emulation on it, uh, you know, 360 emulation, but it's really the PS2 era emulation, and you know, like Dreamcast and like and and, and yeah, it's fine that. that it it yeah. just kills it. It does it so well. Mm. And in a portable format, because we've always had it on PC for a long time now. Mm-hmm. Like PC mm-hmm. SX, PC SX two, fantastic on PC now, and with not that high end hardware, you, you know you can get good performance. But again, that's PC. You know you fix on your you know at your desk, and you know, over the years I've tried you know I've you know done like a media PC you know home theater PC to connect it up to my TV to do some of the you know obviously regular games, but also these emulators as well but like having this in your hand and being able to play like god of war for example or an old crash bandicoot wrath of cortex on the yeah. go you know in a different country is just uh, I, I, what valve has done fantastic i know asus obviously is doing with the rog ally mm-hmm. with the slightly higher end hand saying that the ao neo as well but mm-hmm. steam at the price point and 
they've got the experience of working with games and a gaming platform plus all those other ones they have windows on there most of them do mm-hmm. and yeah. though you can get some nice performance and then you can also do some other things like potentially with mods and piracy and all the other stuff that i think many gamers you know do enjoy it's still the big problem that you have with pc games it feels pc like whereas with steam mm-hmm. deck it's yeah i mean it's got some bugs but a lot of them have been resolved <laughs> now but you download it and you just play it it's more akin to downloading a game on PS5 than downloading it on PC. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it feels like that. You know, it's very integrated, very well thought out. Um, yeah, you're not really exposed to the operating system unless you want to, you know. Uh, very, very simple. Yeah. Plus the control scheme, like, you know, the physical controls, like, because it's bigger, like, it's one of the things, when you f- when they first showed it off before people got their hands on it, so I remember, I, I, I myself fought it, and a lot of people online fought it, that, like, it looks so chunky, but when you get your hands on it, it's like, now oh, this is actually just comfortable. Yeah, it's good. This yeah, is nice. ideal. Like, <laughs> I, I remember playing Super Mario Odyssey on my Switch when mm-hmm. that came out. I played it a lot, you know, great game. But I would always find like my hand and my fingers would cramp up. It just wasn't comfortable. Like I'm a obviously a guy and my hands like they're not big, but they're you know bigger than like a child's or like a, you know a, you know a, mm. a woman's hand. So like I ended up getting like these rubber grip things that went around the the Switch controllers. You know the you know mm. the. The, the Joy Cons, yeah, oh, yeah, the Joy Cons that made them um, feel more like a regular controller with the bump at the bottom, and that alleviated a lot of it. But it still wasn't the same as obviously having, you know, a an Xbox controller, yeah, like an yeah. Xbox controller yeah. or a PS Five or PS Four yeah. controller. And with the Steam Deck, they've just done that amazingly well. Then with the trackpads as well and the touch screen, like it's all, it, it feels like it's a developer test device that they've released, but they've actually refined. Like, it, 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 it's strange. My, my theory is Valve released it to help people get through their Steam backlog. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like they, probably. Like, <laughs> I feel like, like a lot of people, I know myself included, just ended up playing older games because they run some, Yes. Like, the thing is, you can go on there, play a game from 10 years ago, max it out, max resolution, get 60 <laughs> yeah. FPS, and that high-end game from 10 years ago, Still looks good to looks good on, on the that small, small screen. screen. Yeah, it does. Because uh, well, so, so, the game that I'm uh, in the middle of on my Steam Deck is Max Pain Free oh, and I GTA love that 4. Game. And yeah. they run so good and they look so well on that small screen. I, I'm making a note to install Max Pain 3. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I remember when I first, you know, the, the funny thing about that game is it came out, I want to say in 2011, um... when I was at university. And I used to. Was it not sooner? Uh, say it again. Was it was it not sooner than? I've got a memory sooner than that. And anyway, no, no, no. He, 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 I'm I'm positive with 2011 because ah. I was in second year of uni, and I was in yeah. second year from 2011 to 2012, and I'm sure it <laughs> came out at the uh, okay. near the start of my second year of uni. So it's okay. 2011, I want to say, and uh, I used to pirate a lot of games back then, and <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I had the game, you know, downloading on torrents. Actually, I don't think I was using torrents then. I think that I remember ebbed and flow. I think I went to like news groups or maybe news groups was a little later, uh, you know, <laughs> in my university, you know, pirating phase. But like, I, let's say it was torrents. I was downloading it. The speed was, because he had just come out. So the speed was like, ah, it's okay, uh, you know, for, for the pirating. I had downloaded the demo on Steam and i played it i got probably five ten minutes into it. i was like this game just feels so amazing i turned it off i you know canceled the part you know download on you know BitTorrent or whatever i was using at the time and i just purchased it on steam the first i looked on like amazon because it was it was late at night so no store was open either to be able to go and buy it Uh, and i looked on amazon and it was much cheaper but i was like i'm not gonna get that for a day or two I'm gonna just purchase it on Steam and you know just have the legit version and have mm. no issues with the piracy side of it. Like yeah. it, sometimes they, that happens where you just you play and you're like no, I, I'm I'm gonna give them the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, like they did an amazing job with Max Payne Three. So yeah, it, you know, wrapping up. Last question. 
does money buy you happiness and what does a good life mean to you? <laughs> um, the obvious answer is no. Uh, I mean, okay. Um, I guess there's a middle ground. Having enough not to worry is nice. I guess that's the common answer. And it's, and it's true. Um, happiness? Mm, no. I mean, you can't just buy your way to being happy. So, uh, what was the second part of that question? What does a good life mean um, yeah, for what me? What does a good life mean to you? I think for me, it's um, I feel lucky that I can choose to work on what I want to work on. So uh, that that's a good life for me. Is uh, if I get involved in a project, it's because I want to be there. You know, I'm trying to solve some problem that I think will benefit people. Um, so that that's as simple as that for my good life is. I spend my time on things that, um, you know, I only have to do, and I very rarely spend my time on things that are a chore or, you know, uncomfortable or undesirable. That that, that doesn't really happen. So I, I feel lucky that I can I can do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely very important. You know, having something that you you know you can enjoy, that you you can sink your teeth into that you know, provides fulfillment. Obviously, you know, you've got to, you know, if you just look at it, you know, from a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, <laughs> you've got to fill, you know, the you know, the bottom sections, you know, you've got to get them. Part of that yeah. is money related. That is the universal, yeah. you know, one of the universal currencies, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, we use as a you know, society. But, you know, it's not the be all and end all. And I think, you know, th- if something comes along, let's say you're earning, say, a good salary, let's say you're earning £100,000 a year uh, in X job, but there's another job that comes up and let's say that's £90,000, but mm-hmm. you feel like the work that you're going to be doing, the team that you're going to be in, it's going to really make you happy and make you fulfilled and make you excited. That might be worth the jump, like making that you know change even though you should i guess you know as a society we say you know the next role should always be a bit more money like no. obviously if you're earning <laughs> super low like let's say you're earning 18 20 000 and you're struggling then yeah That's okay you, you might want to make you know a decision from so, a different you know i think my first four jobs when we discussed my progression or career earlier every time i moved job i went down in money until eventually when I started the company, it got to zero. So when I was describing that trajectory to you from, you know, um, like programmer to academic, the company founder, um, that was a downward trajectory in my salary. <laughs> or, or let's say, maybe not in real numbers, but effectively free money at the end of the month. Um, so but what did go up was happiness. So if you just look at the number and sh- you know, should I move from a programmer to an academic? The answer is no. <laughs> you, you definitely make more money as a programmer. Um, and it was, I think I, my salary dropped by a third, maybe, or something. So it, was, it wasn't just like 10% in your example. It was way more than that. Uh, but I still did it. And then when I moved from Northern Ireland to England, that was quite expensive. It's more expensive to live here. Um, and my salary went up a tiny bit, but the real cost of living went down because of the cost of living in Brighton, whatnot. So again, that was a downward trajectory. And then when I left that job to start a company, my salary obviously went to zero. So my, my, my path is the exact opposite of what you're meant to do if you only look at finance. But my happiness curve is through the roof. You know, I, I think touch wood, I'm generally very stable. Like I've been the same for decades. I, I don't really change. Um, I'm very consistent in the things I do. And the, the only other thing I would mention here about you asked, what's a good life? I would put health above anything else. So it's nice to be fulfilled and I'm lucky that I can choose the jobs I want. And I, I work I work four days a month. So I can, you know, I'm not maxed out here. Um, but the only other thing I would, that would beat that for me is health, where I, uh, I run three times a week, pretty much. It's not going to fail. I've done it for decades. Um, not because I have to, but I like doing it. But it's also good for me. You know, it's a bit of, bit of a double win, so... So that's my good life. I get the run, I drink tea, and I work on problems that I like working on. And I'm content, I'll say that. <laughs> Health and internal fulfillment. There we go. 
you know, if we're pointing this, you know, simply. And Steam Deck. And, yeah, I, I mean, that's something that, you know, as I'm, you know, 31 now, I'll be 32 at the end of the year, it's definitely something that I'm appreciating more is the health side of things. I do exercise, you know, more now. I am more conscious about, you know, what I eat. I still, you know, <laughs> you know I do end up, you know, indulging. But, like, I, I, <laughs> it's definitely something that I'm appreciating more so now and then obviously you know the work side of things but then obviously now that i've got a family you know that side of things as well versus how i was and my mentality 10 years ago when yeah. i was wrapping up university it's definitely you know changed a lot i think if people can you know especially at your age where don't leave it too late i guess is what i was going to say so if you're not um you know if anyone listening if you're not looking after yourself in you know in the way you think you should um, and, that, and that's mentally and physically, by the way. Um, then, you know, prioritizing that's going to, for the rest of your life, it's not a one-off thing. But get into the habit of doing it. Um, this is, this. we talked earlier about setting the conditions for success in a company. I think these things, like your mental health, your physical health, are setting the conditions for the rest of your life for you to succeed. If, you, if you're not looking after those, you're prioritizing those, then, I, I don't know, the future may not be great or as good as it could be. Like, I can't imagine what's more important than that, you know. I mean, 100% agree. So, yeah, I mean, that's all we have today, folks, for this week's episode of Fire Dev with Graham McAllister. Uh, you know, it was great to have you on here, Graham, to talk about, you know, the different side of being in the industry and especially in the gaming industry. Because, you know, as, you know, you rightly, I think you said before the podcast, you know, a lot of the people that I get on, it, you know, our programmers, our artists are the ones that you typically, you know, think of, you know, I'm doing air quotes now as well, like as doing the work. But, you know, mm-hmm. there's so many other aspects of, you know, development and game development that, you know, it's good to see that side of it and good for people to see that, okay, I like games. I want to get into the gaming industry, but I don't want to be a coder, but I can still be within the industry and mm-hmm. do something different. Yeah, I think that's what I excited. One of the things that excited me about coming on your podcast is just raising awareness that there are so many more jobs in the game industry than people imagine. But given that previous job I mentioned in playtesting, um, it, it wasn't that, it's not, it's not popular today even, but it wasn't even 10 years ago when I started the company, all the advice was to not start it. It's like, really? Are people going to pay for that? That's not a company, you know? So if people tell you that's not a job or, you know, there's no space for that in the game industry, don't necessarily believe that to be true. Do your own research and understanding. If you if you truly believe this, this is needed. Like the thing I do today, the team alignment, the reason why I won't give it up is I truly believe it's needed. This, this is definitely going to help, you know, teams to perform better. It's setting the conditions for success. So I, I can't let that go. Yeah, I mean, 100% agree. You know, uh, you know, just because somebody tells you that either it can't be done or it's just stupid or, you know, nobody would be interested in it, you know, ask mm. people. Like, you know, obviously, you know, pe- not just people that you know or just say yes. You know, obviously, you know, everyone's got yes people in their life. And sometimes that's family because, you know, they love you or it's just, you know, just other you know friends or just other people that just, you know, want to end the conversation. So they'll just say yes instead of having an actual conversation. Mm. But, you know, you know, just pose it to be like, would you be willing to, you know, pay for this? And, and sometimes it might be even that okay, you're offering for free because if you can't, you know, off if if you can't get somebody to have it for free, then obviously, yeah, you know, at that point you can start reevaluating what you're offering. But if you can get somebody to have it for free, then you can be like, okay, they're having it for free, they're enjoying it, they're getting value out of it. Now, could I charge for it? Would they pay for it? Uh, and then that can, you know, help you rethink and reshift, you know, your focus. And there's one more way I think your listeners can maybe figure out. You know, if they've got an idea, they're trying to understand, is this a thing in the game industry? Can I do this? So the, the ways you mentioned, like asking people, that's called an obtrusive measure. Like you have to physically ask someone, you know. So there's a, an alternative way of trying to figure out this evidence called unobtrusive measures. It usually comes up in culture, like an unobtrusive measure of culture. So if I'm interested in measuring a company's culture, like I can go and survey the company using one of the established models. Obtrusive, right? I have to go and take up their time. The unobtrusive measure would be I'm going to look at Glassdoor reviews or their company reports. And from analyzing those documents, I can get an understanding of are they, do I see a problem here? 
like when I started my last company, my unobtrusive measure, me getting evidence to say, do I think play testing is needed, is I would analyze game reviews. At the time, I'd be buying Edge magazine. And every month I bought Edge, I still have them, I would be color coding all the words linked to usability or user experience. So if the reviewer said the controls are wonky or the game gets boring or it's confusing what to do, I had a different color for every single type type of human issue that was with the game or design issue with the game. This is me saying, look at all the forms of evidence that is coming up in these game reviews. These game reviews are telling me that these designs are flawed. It just so happens I have the training, I was an academic, that precisely is designed to remove all these flaws from the game review. And if that were removed, that company would have done better, the players would have enjoyed it more, the company would have made more money. I think I can start a company doing that. So this, this unobtrusive measure can be very powerful for your, for your listeners, I think. Look for evidence that gives weight to the idea that they have, and that may encourage them to start a company. Oh yeah, like you know, having you know the evidence and you know seeking it can definitely help. So yeah, that's it, everyone, for this week's episode of Fire Dev. Graham, you know, thank you for coming on. You know, it was great talking to you. Thanks for having. Thanks very much for having me. Bye, everyone.